You don't want a tow yard there. Why? Because it's a tow yard. What's wrong with the tow yard? What's right with the tow yard? You're quiet. There you not, go. On, not on the kitchen of the community, regardless. Put the West Center Street. Why would we go off more than that? You need to clear your roads and you need a place to put them. Right, so go out and find a heavy commercial zone to put them. Why? They're not, they're, 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 they're not heavy commercial. Well, they shouldn't be in the general commercial zone. They're, they're, they're not noisy. They just park cars. It's like a, a it's like Larry Miller dealer, dealership. No they don't drink and put a dealership there. There's no difference though. They just park cars there temporarily. You don't even know what a tow yard does. No, no, no. Have you, you ever been, been to a tow yard? Yes. <laughs> we will just disagree on that. Have you ever been towed? Um, it's been a very long time. I, I think there's better places to put one. I mean, again. Policymakers want to do it, then I'll. But my recommendation would be not to allow that. They wanted to do it on the state level. Yeah, and that's fine. I've heard that part too, but. Exactly. Just because the locals don't know better? No. Well, that's what that, that's what that statement means. If, 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 no, that's that, what that statement means. Let's just have one downtown then. And then what the problem is is the only people that are giving us a hard time are the cities. Right, because the cities don't want stuff like that in place. Let's have one downtown.
All right, good evening. I will call the Provo City Planning Commission hearing for September 12th to order. Uh, on the agenda this evening, we have five items. The items that are marked with an asterisk are legislative and they require a final decision by the Municipal Council and we will be making recommendations on those items to Council. The items that are not asterisk are items that we will approve, disapprove, continue, and um, do not require municipal decision. We'll start tonight with a prayer and the Pledge of Allegiance. The prayer will be led by Mr. Smith and the Pledge of Allegiance by Mr. Knudsen. Our Father in heaven, we come before thee this day and we give thee thanks for the wonderful city that we live in, the wonderful land that we have, the neighbors that we have, and the civility that we have, and we're thankful to thee for that. We're thankful for all those that serve, and please bless them. Bless us this evening that we will have civil discourse and that we will make headway in the right direction for Provo City as a whole. We pray for these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you. We'll start with roll call by the commissioners, starting on my left with Mr. Phillips. Uh, I have no conflicts. Shannon Ellsworth, no conflicts. Brian Smith, I have no conflicts. Deborah Jensen, no conflicts. Jamin Rowan, no conflicts. Robert Knudsen, no conflicts. Thank you, commissioners. All right, we will read the first item in then. Item one, Western Community Crossroads LC requests an ordinance text amendment to section 14.34.350, recreational vehicle storage, including boats, trailers, and recreational vehicles, and towing impound yards to increase buffering requirements when adjacent to a residential zone. This has citywide application, and Mr. Wright will present this item. All right, thank you. So this item, uh, you'll recall, uh, you heard it a, a few meetings back uh, in July, and uh, the item was continued to allow staff to go back and address some issues that, uh, that came up as we were reviewing the applicant's ordinance amendment to uh, amend the section of code. Um, while doing so, we saw that there were some, uh, some inconsistencies within the, the code when it relates to uh, these uses. Uh, 1434.350 is the section of the code that uh, outlines the requirements and, and lists the zones which uh, these uses are um, conditional use, uh, are approved with conditional use permits. Um, but then if you go to some of the zones that they're actually in, the wording in there talks about um, some of those being permitted uses. And so there's just a little bit of inconsistencies that we uh, went through and tried to clean up and add those in attachment um, attachment number one. Attachment number two uh, is the applicant's um, proposed ordinance amendment. So you have um, two now to, to kind of look through and, and see. Um, with the first uh, attachment, staff's kind of gone through uh, a section of code in 1434.350. Um, made some recommendations there. And in doing so, we kind of came up with some questions that we wanted to uh, bring to the Planning Commission, get your feedback and on some of those items and be able to uh, then go back and, and uh, add things or, or tweak things as necessary to um, make sure we're headed in the right direction there. So the recommendation would be that the item is continued again, but that we receive some some feedback to point us in the right direction. Uh, 
with with this uh, ordinance amendment. So some of the questions that uh, we came up with um, regarding this was um, <clears throat> first that the, uh, the the ordinance kind of in 1434-350 outlines some of the requirements that uh, would have to be in place for one of these uses. And so staff looked at that and, and thought, are there additional items we should be adding to this? If not, or if so, let's, let's add them. Um, but then let's look towards making this just be a permitted use as long as they meet certain criteria. And so the Planning Commission, if you guys have um, additional thoughts on criteria that should be included in there that could um, make it so that as long as those items are all being met, that the item could be um, a permitted use or the, uh, the use on a property within one of those zones that's established there could be a permitted use. We created a map uh, on the next slide here. If can go to that, it kind of shows uh, where those zones are. Um, thanks. So what we did was the areas that are pink, that basically shows uh, those zones that are called out in 1434, uh, 350. And the areas that are uh, in yellow are residential. The, the red is the general commercial zone. Um, and then the green is the agricultural zone. We, we took... Uh, I'll try to compile a list of existing tow yards that are in the city, and those are shown in black there. Um, they're a little bit larger so that they can show up on the map than, than they are in real life, but that's just so you can see them here on the map. Um, with that, um, part of our analysis was that in the existing CG, the general commercial zone, um, it's listed in that zone as a conditional use, but it's not listed in 1434-350. Um, and so staff's recommendation would be that it's uh, taken out of the CG uh, zone as a conditional use. Um, and the reasonings there is that um, the general commercial zone is one of the least industrial of, of all these other zones where they're um, proposed to be permitted. Um, it has significant borders uh, near residential zones. Um, and those are viable commercial areas that we feel like the, um, the non-commercial use of an impound yard, for example, uh, doesn't make the most sense in one of those uh, prime retail areas within our city. Um, so another, um, another question we kind of came up with, with was a setback. Uh, requirement or criteria for these uh, uses in the applicants um, proposed ordinance amendment they they propose to change it from 10 feet which it currently is to 200 feet if it's adjacent to residential um, staff looked at our transitional development standard section of our code which is basically if if there's a residential use next to a more intense use like a commercial or industrial use that there's some setback criteria and in there it's 10 feet as well um, but staff felt it would be it could be appropriate to increase that from 10 feet to 20 feet to have a buffered setback um, then another question came up as to um, so there's walls that would be required or fencing that would be required around these uh, tow yards or um, recreational vehicle uh, yards and so that fencing, should it be at the property line or should it be after the buffered uh, setback so that the fence or wall isn't right up against a residential property and thus creating a, another barrier? Um, so I think those are some of the questions that we came up with. Um, we'd like to get your feedback on that and then um, take this back and, and see if we can address those things and then bring it back to you at a future time. And I'd be happy to answer any additional questions you have at this time. Thank you. Commissioners, any questions for Mr. Wright? Ms. Ellsworth. 
So we're asking two questions. One is, broadly, one is, should we allow these um, impound yards in certain zones? And if so, what are the mitigating factors around permitted impound yards? Is that right? So the question is, yes, they're already permitted in several zones, but as conditional uses. Mm -hmm. um, as you've experienced, uh, conditional uses are cumbersome to deal with, and it's very difficult to just say no to them. So does it make sense to add any additional conditions that would make sense so that they could become permitted uses? Okay. Now, there is one zone that is an outlier. That is that CG zone. It is not nearly as industrial as the other zones where these are permitted, and you can see on the map how many CG zones are adjacent to residential. So we would recommend that we remove it as a conditional use from the CG zone. But uh, the first question is, should we should we even go down this road of making them permitted uses? Okay. Staff would like to take every conditional use we can get out of the code and make it permitted one way or another. They're, they're cumbersome. I like but that. we'll rely on your recommendations. Okay, thanks. So you're proposing on this that for CG, it's not a permitted or a conditional use? Okay. Any other questions for staff? Is the applicant present? And would you like to speak to your item? Thank you. And uh, we have a new procedure for hearings that uh, you state your name for the record and also sign in. Hopefully the sign-in sheet's there. Thank you. My name is Steve Turley. I'm the applicant. Uh, I live in Provo, and I own property adjacent to a, a new proposed yard. Uh, July 4th, visiting a family out of, out of state and got a, got a text message from the neighbor that said, hey, look what's moved in. Uh, and it took a picture, there's some pictures, uh, from, the, from the roof of the adjacent property. Um, uh, these, are, these are pictures of, uh, of, of what moved in next to my, my property. If you can just kind of uh, uh, scroll through those pictures. This is the impound yard that, uh, that wasn't permitted at the time that, that you see this, um, uh, what's going on here. Um, you'll see to the left, I, I think that's supposed to be, under, under any ordinance, uh, that's supposed to be a, a, a a fence that you can't see through, but uh, I think they're missing a few slats. And I, I will say that within the last week, they've they've put up some black plastic around uh, this area here. And to the right is an open uh, parking area. I don't know what differentiates the difference between surface parking to the right and uh, and and then the impound yard there to the left. There's a trailer there at the back and an RV, and someone lives there. And uh, and we did have some pictures of, of someone urinating in the yard. We thought we'd spare you those those uh, details. We um, uh, there's some other pictures, another another batch of pictures from the. Uh, I sent a second email. Sorry, it's from the roof of the one-story building immediately to the south, and uh, and that's that's the purpose of I guess uh, one of the one of the reasons why I made this application is um, is we talk about a lot of these setbacks, the fencing requirements, the buffering, the fencing, all that is is kind of assuming you're just walking on the sidewalk or you're driving down the road. But for those of us that uh, that have a this is from the building immediately to the south. It's one, it's one story high. And this is a picture of, of the impound yard um, uh, where uh, the, the southern half of that fenced off property is, is actually my property. Um, so it was a little odd to have uh, someone uh, set up an impound yard on, on, on my property and, uh, and they've been given notice and they still haven't moved, which is, um, we'll, we'll work on that, I guess, on, in another way. But that's what the neighbor's going to look at. And this is a commercial property looking down into this, into this impound yard, which I'm going I'm to keep reminding you over and over again that this is not permitted. There was no business license requested for this use. This was just someone setting up shop and, and trying to get away with it, I think. Um, uh, and, and you see the fencing, how, how much uh, uh, site obscuring fencing exists on that site, um, virtually none. Um, but the um, but to the uh, uh, immediately to the west of this property is where we're building a an 18 million dollar uh, three story project uh, residential project. Um, uh, this body had the opportunity to uh, to discuss this, to uh, to work it over, and to approve it. And what I think uh, y your deliberations did is is to make it better. But I will remind you that to the west of my project, a four acre uh, townhome project, to the west of that project, I had to buffer my height away from the boundary 
of the immediately adjacent residential property. So to the west are, is a single level series of houses and some duplexes um, uh, that, that lie immediately to the west. And I had actually offset my buildings because of the height that was allowed for in the, in the uh, low density residential zoning. I had to bring my buildings significantly back from that to avoid this exact problem here so that my people on their, on their upper floor looking out their window aren't, aren't, uh, aren't looking directly down into this kind of stuff. So my, my application was, uh, was, was contemplated as I'm driving home from, from Wyoming. Um, as I drove past this place for the first time um, on my, um, uh, 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 when I got back into town, it was about 12.45 at night, and there were three trucks in there with the lights on the top, and they were moving around a whole bunch of cars in there. And I just thought, wait a minute, is that what we want to have happen in this area, adjacent to residential units, along a corridor that has its own design standards for beautification, for preservation of the, of the corridor's you know, sensitivities? Um, and then also, uh, immediately across the street, you'll see to the east side of the street, is where Provo City and UDOT have spent hundreds of thousands of dollars to try and beautify that corridor. So you can see the planter boxes, the, the, the sidewalk, the walking path, uh, all the landscaping that's been put in there, of which, on the other side of the street, you, you see what we have. And through our existing ordinances, we allow this. Or at least we allow that, that there are conditions that can be met for this kind of stuff to happen. So when I got the staff report, I was, um, uh, I didn't, I'm sorry, when I made my request, I didn't think I was asking too much to say, keep it 200 feet away from residential uses. I mean, at 1245 at night, I don't want to be sitting there listening to some tow truck move cars back and forth, and that's when their busy time is. I understand that the carpenter seed might do business from eight to five, um, but then they shut down, and that is a compatible use with, a, with an immediate um, neighbor's residential. But this, on the other hand, they're, they're, they're happening during, those, during those, the wee hours of the morning, and I don't think that's compatible. So, so yeah, I requested a 200-foot setback, uh, thinking that, that perhaps that would, um, that would allow for the neighbor not to have to look down into stuff like this, but then also allow for those sites those, those, the, that visual blight uh, that happens in parking lots, and also the, uh, the, the noise that happens with, uh, with that kind of activity at late at night would be far enough away so that it wouldn't disturb the residents. Um, but 10 to 20 feet doesn't do anything. A six foot high fence doesn't do anything. I don't care how, how thick it is. I don't care how, what, what kind of material it's made of. It doesn't, doesn't change that, that, that type of activity and that type of disruption to, to what goes on there. So, so taking it out of some of these uses maybe, maybe is a solution. Um, uh, to, to set it back in such a way so that it doesn't have those, those negative uses. We don't have a lack of, uh, of, of industrial or, or, or heavy use, uh, heavily, heavy industrial use zoned properties in the city. It's not like there's a shortage, there's plenty of it. Take a look at our map. It actually, I think, is a, uh, as I did my rude calcula uh, crude calculations yesterday, I think there's more uh, manufacturing and industrial property in the city than there is this, this uh, general commercial or this, um, this CM zoning. So, so my hope is that we can find a good place for these types of uses and that those areas aren't immediately adjacent to, uh, to residential uses. Please consider that, that the impact uh, of this decision directly impacts uh, South State Street and the, and, the, and the really concerted efforts that have been made to revitalize that effort. So we have a choice of this, or we have a choice of what's on the other, other side of the street, which is uh, significantly, I think, more, uh, more favorable to what, uh, is what I've heard that uh, an awful lot of the decision makers want to have happen. The only other thing that in, in, this, in this process that I'm a little uh, I, I wonder about is, is I, I pay pretty good attention to the neighborhood process, and, and I haven't heard any invitation about neighbors or neighborhood chairs or neighborhood meetings uh, uh, to discuss this. I hope that there's a concerted effort made to find out what the neighborhoods think about, about these kind of uses and their zoning. So anyway, thanks for your time. Any questions? Thank you. Commissioners, any questions for Mr. Turley? Thank you. If not, thank you. Are there any neighborhood chairs present who would like to speak to item one? Are there any members of the community who would like to speak to this item? Please come forward and s state your name for the record and sign in, please. Hello.
Leo Lines, former neighborhood chair. Um, I'm, I'm on a uh, governor's committee called the Towing Advisory Board. And um, this, um, this issue has, we're trying to solve this on a state level also, not just in one city. A um, couple um, things that my good friend Mr. Turley said. Uh, the, the picture of, on top of the roof of Carpenter Seed, um, nobody's ever going to be on the roof looking over at those cars. Now his apartment complex, yeah, maybe somebody on the third floor might be able to look down in. Um, to the south, the other side, which used to be JC Auto, that place is a mess. There's a 99 Chevy Astro van that's been there since 2001 that was mine, <laughs> and it hasn't moved. And there's just cars galore, and his same um, apartments are going to look into that, and you know that's been there since before he bought the property. And so, um, you know, I don't know why now all of a sudden, you know, there's this big concern. Um, when he said that there's plenty of places for tow yards to go, yeah, there may be plenty of zoned areas, but they're not available. They're not for sale. And they're a million bucks an acre. And a tow yard is, can only just park cars temporarily because there are cars that Provo City has asked them to come and get because they were wrecked on the road and they had to be towed somewhere and then they're gone. They're, it's coming and going. Um, I question whether there were three trucks there one night. Uh, the company only has two employees right now and so and if they were they were just probably trying to get some cars moved around because they were just setting this up. That lot has had a number of junk cars parked on it for years and years. The same spot and there was never a peep about it. Um, the, so on the state level, we're trying to figure this out to where, you know, but this, the state already has regulations for what a yard has to have. And so, and they are quiet. Yes, occasionally a car will come in. It's not every night. It's not every time at two in the morning. But when they're bringing a car in at two in the morning, it's because Provo City has called them and said, hey, there was a wreck. I need you to move this off the roads and, and take care of it. And so, you know, yes, that, that may be a problem, but I don't think it's that big of a problem. Um, there's other places that I think you, the cities need to open up to where these could be that wouldn't be next to residential. And then what you're forgetting too, these, uh, is it the black marks that are, those are not all the, to the impound yards in Provo. Um, is the Larry- License is for. Well, is, is, is Larry H, well, see, that's the other thing is they don't, they're not required to have a business license. Tow yards are only, towers are only supposed to have one business license in the whole state. And then they can operate anywhere in the state. They don't have to have one in every city. That's in Utah state code. Um, but like, for example, Larry H. Miller is a tow yard. They go get cars that are wrecked and put them in their yard on a regular basis. I think that's Larry Miller right there. Yeah. Is that Larry Miller there? I think so. Is Robbins on here? Yeah, so the, the dealerships also have tow yards associated with them. So we've, as far as I know, we have licenses. And then the other one is repo, repo companies. And that's one the state's trying to get a hold of because they repo a lot of cars and then they take them to their homes or their, you know, that's one of the things we're trying to change is that cars are to be taken to a safe location that meet the requirements that the, the tax commission has for a, a legal yard. And so, and this property was zoned properly. Uh, when he called her and rented it from her, it was zoned for tow yards. Um, and so, you know, it wasn't like it wasn't allowed and he just jumped on there willy-nilly. And so, um, but anyway, so there, there needs to be places for him. I, I don't want to say a necessary evil because they're not evil. They, they clear the roads. There's a use for them. When you get in an accident, you need your car taken to a safe place and you need to be able to come to a place where you can get your medicine, your baby bottles, your car seats out of the car uh, from the wreck. And those need to be accessible. Right now, a lot of these yards are out in the booners. And so at two in the morning, you're trying to find where your car was taken so you can go down and get your medicine. You can't find them. And they're in horrible parts of town. You know, so that there's, it's, it's a two-way street here type of thing. So just take those into consideration. Um, but those, uh, 
you know, Provo City, I don't know how many, uh, there's probably 30 or 40 companies on the rotation here in, in Provo, and that's just Provo City, not, not counting the, the freeway, because the freeway ones have to come some, to a yard somewhere, and most of these people are on those towing um, rotations, and so when there's an accident on the freeway, they have to tow it somewhere. And so, and the state requires that. They have to be taken to a state tax yard. And so, uh, but, but there is not a lot of traffic. It's not that often. And so it's not as, it's not as bleak as what it sounds is what I'm saying. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lyons. Are there any other members of the community who would like to speak to this item? Uh, Dave Connect, live in Southeast Provo. And uh, at this time I happen to be on the city council. Just wanted to let you know, a couple of extra things that uh, two days prior to the council considering this and putting in their own application, Steve Turley applied, so the chair decided to let him go forward and the council did not put in its own application, which would have been for a 100-foot setback. Secondly, I did go down and visit this. Uh, I drive by it day daily. And I think one of the reasons why there might have been multiple vehicles there is if you look at the signs, there's like four or five companies, different names, different addresses, different phone numbers, and there's different trucks with different logos. It's not just one. There's, there's, a, there's a whole bunch operating here. And maybe that's one thing that we could look at uh, in our code is how many operations can operate out of the same location. I mean, if that's a concern, I, in this case, I think it is. And I, I, the council was going to send it to you because they don't, in this case, feel that what's happening is appropriate. And um, so I just thought I'd share that. Thank you, Mr. Connect. Mr. McGinn. Uh, every time the mayor or a council member comes and speaks in front of the planning commission, I then get up right after to remind you uh, an individual member of the council does not speak for the council. The council acts as a majority of a quorum. And so any comments by a council member are personal comments and not comments representing the count, uh, municipal council. Thank you. Madam Chair, if I could just clarify one or two things. Please. So the adjacent towing yard is in the CM zone where it's a conditional use. The tow yard operator has applied for a conditional use permit. He's filed an application. We're holding that application because this legislation was introduced, this application, which is now pending legislation, came in first. As long as we have pending legislation going through the process, we can't process a conditional use permit that may be subject to the pending legislation. So we're holding that application pending the outcome of this debate, discussion, and whatever the city council ultimately does. When that is heard as a conditional use permit, if it's heard as a conditional use permit, or if it's allowed as a permitted use, but with conditions, they'll have to comply with ordinance and conditions. Right now, you know, you have to have a, uh, substantial wall. Um, you have to do several things that they haven't done yet because they haven't been granted a conditional use permit. That's all I have. Thank you. Mr. Turley, did you have any final uh, response to any of the comments made? No, thank you. Okay, thank you. All right, I will turn this back over to the commissioners then for discussion. Mr. Smith. Thank you, Madam Chair. I am inclined to uh, agree to continue this in order to answer the questions that were asked and um, to look at look at the distance, distances and and you know where the the buffer is inside or outside the fence and things like that. I think that there's a little bit more work to do and more input that can be made on this. And I'm not inclined to to be in in a real hurry. Um, I think that there's some value to continuing this, so I would make a motion to um, continue item one to uh, the, the next meeting, September 26th. 
Do we have a second? I second that motion. Thank you. Seconded by Mr. Phillips. Can I can I just ask a question before we take a vote? Am I was I understanding you right, um, uh, Dustin? That that you wanted to get some input tonight. So before we vote on it, you would like us to say just at least a little bit. Yeah, that'd be helpful to get some feedback from the planning commission, so we could go back over the next uh, little while here and and uh, redraft anything that's needed to. Um, Put into the ordinance uh, what it is that you guys feel is important to include so yes we would like that feedback so we can go back and and make some changes if needed so I'm inclined to you know agree with the motion that's that's been made uh, but I'll just maybe respond at, at least to some of the questions again given our experience with the conditional use permit I agree I mean I, I think that finding a, a different way to go about business would be good and if that's um, you know permitted uses then I you know I'm, I'm fine with proceeding in, in that way. Um, I think that one of the questions that I don't see here, or, or the questions that are here wouldn't produce an answer that would address one of Mr. Turley's concerns, but I think is a really legitimate one, which is that, you know, on a, on a street like State Street, you know, do we want, you know, what do we want to be there uh, going forward? Um, I would be inclined to say, I mean, I, I know that there are a variety of things there, but things are changing. Uh, you know, we've got that new park going in, um, you know, and, um, I, you know, I, I wouldn't want a, a towing, um, an impound yard on a kind of main collector street. I, you know, I don't, I, I don't think that's a great idea. Um, I do definitely agree they should be removed from the general commercial zone, the CG zone. Um, I'd be inclined to say that that fence should exist you know there should the, the landscape buffer should be visible uh and then the fence you know whatever the setback is that we decide upon whether that's 100 feet 200 feet um agreed whatever it is you know i want i want landscaped and then the fence um it, it, again just in my kind of initial response um i certainly would be inclined to be really cautious about anything adjacent to a residential um, it, whether in relation to the buffer outside the fence. So that was one of the things we debated as a staff. Uh, Mr. Turley's required to have a fence on his property line for his project. So then we may have a 10 or 20 foot landscaped buffer and then another fence. What typically happens is the property owner doesn't take very good care Neglects of that the, yeah. landscaped area. Mm -hmm. And you get anything from windblown trash accumulating in there to uh, these days, we even get homeless people, you know, setting up camp in areas like hmm. that. So, hmm. well, maybe maybe a better question uh, that's not here would be like, what what do we want? Do we want to set um, regulations for the fence itself? I mean, clearly, the fence that uh, we saw in the pictures is, you know, extraordinarily inadequate. Um, you know, so beyond just fence height, do we want to add some additional? Um, Kind of regulations around around the fence, um, material, you know, the, the material that one would be allowed to construct it out of. I mean, the idea of, of taking a chain link fence and kind of wrapping it in black plastic seems. Um, I think that would be appropriate, especially if we're going to make it a permitted use. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so I'd want to I'd want to talk about that. You know, the the nature of that fence. Those are just my some of my initial thoughts that I'd, I'd love to, I suppose. Con continue as you revise and update. And it seems to me, I, I can't remember, just one more thing, Brian or Ms. Smith, in your proposal, did you propose that we continue it until September 26th or just did you not name, specify a date? I said it's September 26th. It seems to me that given all the stuff that's going on, that we're gonna need more time than that would just be my initial hunch. I'm, I'm happy to, to leave that open-ended then. Definitely yeah. be better. I, I would just like to add to that that I would be in support of removing uh, this use from the CG zone. Mm -hmm. I think it's inappropriate there. I would also be in favor of requiring a solid fencing material, preferably masonry, mm -hmm. and that things like chain link, whether it's wrapped or not, not be permitted. Um, I'm, I'm not even in favor of wood, quite honestly. I don't think it, it's a good enough um, sound barrier or uh, visual barrier. 
In regards to the buffer, I heard three different figures floated out there, 20 feet, 200 feet, 100 feet. 10 feet. Um, 10 so, feet. so yeah. <laughs> and it's currently 10 feet. Yes, so four. Um, that's something that needs further discussion and, and uh, thought about. And I would like to see the buffer requirements, not just uh, landscape, but some municipalities put into their buffer requirements between two uses like this, tree spacing of a certain kind. So for example, uh, evergreen tree of a certain species placed so many feet on center so that there is, besides that solid fence, there's also that physical, visual, and auditory barrier between the two uses. So I would like to see something like that incorporated. Um, those are my comments. Ms. Ellsworth. Um, yeah, I'd love to see what, um, what a best practice is on the number of operators for one impound yard is. Is it traditional for there to be multiple or most operating with one? And is that a feasible restriction that we could put in place? Um, and then otherwise, I would totally agree with uh, Ms. Jensen and Mr. Rowan. We, we have, a, you know, the discussion between the buffer zone from 200 to 100 down to 10 and 20, but if, if we're at, at the numbers of 20 feet, we're more likely to get a visually appealing buffered zone than we do at 100 feet. I mean, and this owner is going to be able to take care of it in, at that distance versus... You know, if he if he has a hundred feet around two sides of his of his facility that he has to take care of. I've I've seen buffers required anywhere from twenty to forty feet around these kinds of uses. So I guess this is just something we need to think about and talk through a little bit more. Any other comments, discussion? My only thought on this is, um, I, I mean, I agree with most of the questions one through five, um, um, three, four, and five, yes. Um, two, probably no. Um, and when I, when I think about this and, and see the pictures and have passed by it mo many times, uh, um, it brings to mind the requirements, the really stringent requirements that are put on um, storage facilities. And sure, they probably have a lot higher earning potential than an impound lot or a storage car storage lot. But still, um, they're they're required to, to beautify and and I mean just the the tree requirements that go into those things is incredible. And so I just think that there's more that can be done with this kind of a facility, um, and and it should be done in the right place uh, with a with a decent buffer. Yeah. We also have to remember that, I mean, this kind of facility in all of us, all of us need it on occasion, hopefully not, but, but it's going to affect everyone. Any other comments, Ms. Ellsworth? Is there an impound yard? It doesn't look like it on the map, but there is something comparable on the far west side of Center Street that has all those signs. You know what I'm talking about? Is it, it's a storage unit? Yeah. Okay. Yes, but they've also gotten approval for um, RV storage out there. On the north side? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. That yeah. came through you for the... Yep. I remember that. that. Yeah, I just think that their aesthetic is uh, unique and uh, it calls attention <laughs> to their establishment. And I wonder if we could avoid that in other parts of town. All right, shall we continue with the motion? Yeah, so with the, the motion stands uh, as a, a recommendation or a motion to continue with an open date. And second? And I second it. Thank you. All those in favor of continuing item one? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Right, we will recommend that item one be continued to municipal council. Okay. 
Okay, item number two, Provo City Economic Development Department requests a code amendment to section 14.20.160, parenthesis seven, to increase the amount of residential development in a regional shopping center zone, SC3, from 20% to 33%. This has citywide application. And Mr. Ardmore will present this item. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so this may seem very familiar to you. Uh, <laughs> you saw this a couple weeks back. Um, because of the comments and the concerns that were heard during the last meeting, the applicant uh, decided instead of taking it to the council at that time that he wanted to, that they wanted to change some of the language to try to address some of those concerns and bring it back before you before it goes to the council. So that's what they've done. Um, I'll go through that. So just a quick review of, of how we got here. Um, again, in January 2017, uh, the 20% residential use was uh, put into the SC3 zone uh, to permit residential units a mixed use uh, environment in those areas of the city. Um, uh, economic development believes increase uh, will be of a benefit to the city and to developers in those areas. Um, so the proposal itself, uh, the first couple points here are the same, um, but you go down to the third, the applicant has added language now to restrict the residential use to at least 30 units per acre and at least two stories high to, to try to address some of the concerns from last time and also added language to uh, that to do the residential use in these SC3 zones, you have to have at least 24, uh, 25 acres uh, under single ownership or control uh, of one entity or, or person party. Um, so the, the first amendment here uh, wasn't in the proposal last time. So this is in the purpose and objectives chapter or section of the chapter of SC3 zone. So you can see uh, they've made a couple minor changes there to address the housing use within the zone um, and identified the 30 units per acre there. And the bulk of the change comes in 1421.60. Um, so the 33% the is the same, A is the same, but they added B, C, and D. Um, so again, that, that minimum 30 units per acre, the minimum uh, two stories, and the 25 acres. Um, so they've proposed this for your review and uh, comment and decision. Uh, staff recommends approval, uh, just like we did last time uh, on this, and uh, I'll try to address any questions you have for me, uh, but most questions I would imagine the applicant here could answer them a little better. Thank you. Commissioners, any questions for Mr. Ardmore? If not, I would like to invite uh, Economic Development Representative. Dixon Holmes with the uh, Mayor's Office of Economic Development. Didn't know if the uh, Planning Commission had any questions for me. Um, I think the Planning Commission had a number of questions or at least that were attached to the report of action that uh, if you would like, we can try to address any of those questions that you may have. Um, I think if you could talk about uh, the questions we had at the previous hearing yeah, that, and yeah. your responses to those, that would be appropriate. You bet. Um, so I guess the, big, the first question that the uh, Planning Commission had was um, how a significant increase in residential in the SC3 zone is an effective economic development tool. I guess the way we looked at it was by allowing 20% going to 33% was a 13% increase or increasing that percentage by a third. And that many of the projects nowadays that are mixed use um, actually are um, going towards and, and encouraging residential uses in them. And certainly, um, if a developer came in and said, we'd like to take half our project residential, I, I think that would be too much. Um, I think I publicly said that I have no scientific study as to d demonstrate why 33% is the right number. Um, but at the same time, there needs to be a balance, there needs to be a line someplace. Why was 
is because that's what the applicant wanted. Uh, the 33% actually corresponds to what the mix is trying to do. I think they're about 28%. So again, if the planning commission or the council wanted to hold it at 30%, that, that's okay. Um, interestingly enough, if, if you are familiar with the Riverwoods, the shops at Riverwoods, uh, and then if you also include the villages at Riverwoods, that is about a third of the overall project, the residential portion, if you include the residential and the commercial, it's about a third. And so a third sounded like it's not more than half, uh, it's less than half, it allows for some residential development. I understand the, the planning commission had some concerns and that's why working with the community development staff, we introduced some additional criteria, again, prohibiting single family, requiring stacked unit, and I believe the, the way it was proposed, it should be a minimum of 30 units to the acre, uh, and then the, you'd have to have 25 acres in total. So someone in a, with a single lot in an SC3 zone just couldn't bring forward and say, I, I wanna tear down the Burger King, and it's a one acre parcel, and so a third of this will now be residential. This just didn't seem right. So again, we in, increased or included some criteria there. Um, but in reality, uh, many projects, and, and not just in Provo and throughout the country and, and, and other parts of Utah, are including residential either in the development or they have higher densities right next door. And so uh, the, the landscape of retail across uh, our country, our nation, and, and again here locally, is that residential at higher densities are being introduced because they like to have a ready uh, shopper right there, someone who wants to be closer. And, and, and frankly, we allow residential in our downtown with, with no density or, actually there's probably density minimums maybe. Um, Absolutely. Absolutely there is. I mean. Yeah, right. And so, so again, the concept of having residential and commercial or retail close to each other isn't really new. And, and what it is actually creating is as I would classify it as uh, suburban centers throughout, scattered throughout the community. Um, so the mix and the mall are, are not in the heart of downtown, right? But, but there are many nodes of residential and some commercial. In fact, uh, again, the way it's proposed is that the majority of it would have to be commercial, but allow some residential. So this is responding to a market request and uh, frankly would not feel comfortable with it for it to go, um, to go higher than 33%. Uh, other questions? Um, can, can, can maybe we pause just to ask follow-up questions on, well, on what you, you would that be sure. okay? Oh, absolutely, yes. Um, I, mean, I, I, I think it's, I, I, I don't know, um, I know you weren't here at the last meeting and, and, and uh, it seems at least that some of your, some of your response is, is targeted towards this idea that um, residential and commercial often mix, we totally accept. I mean, that, there, there, that wasn't at all part of our okay. discussion or opposition to the, to the proposal. I mean, of course, uh, that's how things work a lot these days, mixed use. You know, so we're, in no way was the, was the planning commission um, opposed to, to the mixture of the two. Um, so I think that's important to, to kind of lay as a fundamental kind of baseline to the conversation. Excellent. Is that, on the same you know, page. Yeah, is that we're on the same page there of, of mixing those uses. It does seem to me, and, and I'm not hearing what I'd, what I'd hoped to hear from you, uh, not you, but economic development, uh, either now or in the, the handout we were given 15 minutes before uh, walking into this meeting. Um, I'm not hearing a, a satisfying explanation of why 33% uh, above 20. It does seem to me that as a resident, I'm speaking as a resident of Provo sure. more than I am a planning commissioner at this point, you know, that if the city is gonna give away uh, potentially 50 acres of its relatively limited commercial space, I'd want, I'd, want much more, I'd want a much more satisfying answer than 33% is what the developer requested. It seemed, it was less than half, it seemed okay. You know, I'd, I'd, I would expect our economic development team to get out there and see what's working, uh, what's working elsewhere. Are you know, are other places certainly are mixing the two uses, but are they mixing them at th the level of 33%? You know, are they are they 
um, allowing up to 33% of those commercial zones to be zoned residential uh, is medium density residential um, kind of where they're starting or are they asking kind of high density um, residential and, and to not have those kinds of, of answers here um, in, in your response, the economic development response to us, again, just feels really, really dissatisfying to me. I, I, I want, before we give away potentially 50 acres, 50 of our 300 acres, um, you know, I want, I want work done to tell me that this is a, a good idea, that this is a proven idea, rather than just that we're responding to a, an individual developer's request. Is, is kind of what I, what, what, how I would respond to your, to your response just now. Well, you set a high bar, and that's, that's fine. I mean, that's legitimate. <laughs> yeah. um, I understand that. And I wish I had um, a study. Um, I have, you know, some anecdotal, you know, documents, articles, um, trade publications in, in the real estate market. They don't seem to have an exact number either. Uh, again, I, I, I suppose we could continue to continue the item until such a study was done, but I don't know if we'll find it in Provo. And that's why I referenced uh, the Riverwoods, which uh, just happened to be what the number happened to be. I don't think there was a magic number when that project was done either, again, but about a third of the project is residential. Um, again, we, we, we recognize that we do have limited space in our community. In fact, the trend has been, at least from my observation, that uh, commercial areas have been reduced and there's been more residential areas created. And one of the things that retail wants, or at least com retail as far as a subset of commercial, is more housetops within close proximity. If you look at Town Center Mall, um, it's actually not in a very good location. It's great on the freeway, but look at where is the closest houses to it. It's a little bit north, um, not an overly uh, socioeconomic, socioeconomic uh, high earning area for the mall. You compare that to the uh, university place, and it's very well positioned uh, next to neighborhoods that have a higher income status. Provo Town Center Mall doesn't have that. You go to the east, you have to go two miles east, cross two railroad tracks to get to residential. The freeway is great for visibility and for on and off, but again, for the residents that live west of I-15, it's a pretty good sized barrier. There's lake to the south or more freeway. And so again, by introducing, giving opportunity to our, res to our commercial centers to have residential in, and, yeah, I, Commissioner, I think it'd be great to have a study that would say it's, no, it's not 33%, it's actually 27%. But I'm not sure 27% and 33% are dramatically different. And that's why I would say publicly that beyond 33%, I wouldn't be comfortable if a third just sounds and feels right. And, and when we asked in and out Burger where they wanted to go, asked them if they had a study, well, it just feels right about where this should go. And everybody approaches it a little different. Every community approaches it a little bit differently. And again, if, if that's super important to you as a commissioner, you can ask for it and we can see what we can find. I don't know if we'll be able to produce it. But at some level, residential within our commercial zones seems to be right. What's the right number? I don't know, third. Yeah, yeah, I guess, we, you know, we can leave it there. Because right now it's a fifth, right? I mean, so, yeah. and that's what the developer asked for. I mean, I guess they could have come in and asked for a third, and the planning commission and council could have approved it, and if the council said, well, right. what's the basis, they'd probably say, well, it works for our pro forma. <laughs> and that's the bottom line, is most developers work on a pro forma on whether it works. Yeah, I'll let you continue. I, I do think, I mean, I'll just say, and we can return to this, I think there's a major difference between okay. the mix and... Uh, uh, you know, let's say the mall that you were talking about. I mean, the mix is on the UVX line. They built a stop for it there. It's within, you know, yeah, so the mall, close, the mall close proximity, UVX. close proximity to, you know, some of our densest um, living. And, and so, yeah, I mean, I, I just don't find satisfying. Okay. Okay. The, it seems like a good number. Well, so. well taken. Point well taken. Is any other questions for the applicant? Ms. Ellsworth? Just generally, what gives me heartburn on this is the opportunity cost. Okay. 
What do you think the opportunity costs are and how do you think that we'll mitigate those opportunity costs long term in our city where we're, you know, where land is scarce? Uh, again, it's a fair question. Um, we're not growing any more land in Provo. Um, continues to be a desirable place to live and yet we don't have a lot of housing for people to live right now anyway. Uh, we don't have a variety of housing stock in our community. Seem to have the single family residential pegged pretty well, but we don't have some of those medium densities or higher densities that people might be looking for. And frankly, this is an opportunity to put it. Um, by policy and by neighborhoods, most neighborhoods aren't really looking for a lot of more higher density residential in their community. This is a way of dispersing it a little bit. It won't answer all the questions. Uh, so the opportunity cost is, uh, again, um, partly it is a response to the market. And I would love to be able to predict what the future would be for retail and for commercial development land in our community. Um, again, um, absolutely this is a response to the market and to a developer. Um, the mall hasn't come in yet for their request. I assume they will at some point. Um, again, if they wanted to take half of the mall to be residential, I, I, I think I'd personally have some grief with that. But I couldn't put my finger on it other than it just seems like too much. And a lot of this as you drive through a community is how does it feel? Well, if we ran the stats, you might feel different about it because it might have a higher density than what we're comfortable with because that number is so gosh awful high, but yet we drive by and it looks fine because it's designed well. Wish I had a more scientific answer for you. Uh, I'm just going to add my comments. Um, you are talking about two separate paradigms when you talk about Riverwoods, which was one of the first lifestyle centers developed mm -hmm. in Utah, versus the mall and the mix, which are both located on what are major transit investments by the public sector. Mm -hmm. And as such, as I mentioned at the last hearing, I would suggest should be rezoned to something more appropriate, such as ITOD, that will support housing, commercial, a true mix of uses in a pedestrian-oriented environment that will help support those transit investments. Um, I just don't see the validity in allowing SC3 to increase residential without addressing all these other issues. Um, ITOD was established to support transit, ridership, to increase density around those stations. It's being done in Utah in places like Salt Lake, Murray, Draper, where you see commercial and residential development being built around these transit stations. And uh, I think it's a missed opportunity to allow SC3 to just say we're going to allow 33% now instead of 20%, instead of really looking at fundamentally what does the zoning need to be now that we have this big change in transit transportation? Okay, just to continue that if I might ask a question. Oh, I'm sorry, if you, only if you're done though. I'm sorry? Are you, I, I didn't want to interrupt you if you had a couple more comments. I'm good, thank you. Okay, so just then to, to, to that point then, if the mix or the mall came in for ITOD zoning on a portion of their property that was maybe 40%, so is the net effect then the same where we could have residential, so now we just have a different zone? And that would be my question back, that if, if the net effect then is you still have residential at a higher density next to or even in a commercial zone, have you made any difference because you still have residential then that, that remove commercial zoning to accommodate the housing? There, there are two ways that, um, that development, including residential, on let's say the mix, since we're talking about it, we'll use that as an example, mm -hmm. could evolve. One could be that you have a pod of residential sitting next to a pod of office or a pod of retail. They're not in interconnected. It's not a walkable, cohesive environment. Or you could have a TOD zone, which requires walkability, which is in the code, uh, have build two lines, uh, has setback requirements, has parking requirements, reduced parking requirements, 
um, concealed parking requirements. I mean, there's, it can be constructed however uh, the city sees fit to, to write that code. But it is, you know, I would hate to see a site like the mix with this big investment in transportation be developed as another suburban sprawl site. It's not appropriate. I would totally agree, and that's why we recommended no single family residential that has to be stacked, minimum of 30 units to the acre. And that's the beauty of the 25 acre requirement. So if the mix wanted to do residential, and in fact, I think the planning commission and the council is now hearing an item about requiring a certain amount of amenities in the SC3 zone, if there is residential, to get that integrated design so it is cohesive, so you don't have these silos of residential next to silos of commercial and silos of retail so that they are integrated. Um, and that's why we thought the 25 acre requirement. So if someone couldn't come in on a, again, a one acre parcel in the SC3 zone and just say, well, now I'm going to do my token residential or whatever with my retail. So anyway, um, that would be my response to that particular statement or comment question. Commissioners, any other questions, comments for the applicant? I, I mean, oh. just in response to that response, if, if I hear what uh, uh, Commissioner Jensen is saying correctly, we, I mean, th there's a difference between just saying you have to be over 25 acres and saying there's some design standards that we insist upon and there's a density that we insist upon, it, especially in relationship to transit hubs like um, like the mix. And, and the mall is on the, right. the UAVX line also. And the mall. Yeah. Uh, right. I think we, you know, I think we just, as a city, we need a lot more. I, I, I think we'd want to have a lot more say over how that ends up developing and what that ends up looking like rather than just handing it over to a developer who wants to get in and out for, you know, the maximum profit. And I just, you know, I, in the end also, I mean, what's kind of hovering over this is, I just don't feel compelled to sell our, you know, our gold to a single developer for a mess of pottage. You know, I, to, to, to kind of bend over backwards with this, what strikes me as one of our kind of pr most prime locations for revitalization at the mix and to, to, to just eyeball it, to guess it. You know, I'm not asking, I, I, you know, I, I certainly admit to being a little bit ignorant about how economics and economic development works. I'm an English professor. I don't, you know, I don't do numbers. It just seems to me that the economic development must have some kind of way of going about its business that go, that gets beyond eyeballing it. You know, it seems to me that there's, you know, I'm studying places, you know, other locales nearby. What's happening there? Are other cities similar to Provo, poised for similar growth as Provo's poised for growth. You know, to, to to just come in and for and for us for the sake of a single developer say, seems right. Um, I think it's just that's not something I'm willing to do as a member of the planning commission or as a as a citizen of of this community. Appreciate your perspective. Thank you. Are there any neighborhood chairs present who would like to speak to item two? Are there any members of the community who would like to speak to this item? Seeing none, I will turn this back over to the commissioners for further discussion and or a motion. And I guess I'll start. Um, one of the things that we are currently uh, in process on is an update to the general plan and one of the key components of the general plan are transportation and land use. And those are the two chapters that we've dug into so far. And it just seems like it's premature to start changing zoning in these kinds of areas, SC3, um, when that process has just started of really trying to come to grips with and understand the linkages between transportation and land use. That's, that's my thought on the topic. I agree. If I've said what I had to say, <laughs> I'm ready to make a motion unless someone has additional comments they'd like to make. Any other comments? 
Okay, Mr. Rohn. I'd like to make a motion um, that we continue uh, Provo City Economic Development Department's request for a code amendment to section 14.20.160 parenthesis seven to increase the amount of residential development in regional shopping center zone from 20 to 33%. Uh, and I, I propose that we continue that indefinitely, um, specifically with uh, the, the redevelopment of the, or the revision of the general plan in mind, and I'm happy to do some of the homework on, on shopping center zones when other cities have done as part of, that, part of that process to make sure that we get this right. And, and that would be a recommendation to municipal council? Yes. Okay, thank you. Recommend that we continue. Do we have a second to the motion? Yes. I'll second it. Seconded by Mr. Knudsen. All those in favor of forwarding a recommendation for a continuance to Municipal Council for item two? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Nay. One opposed. So we have five in favor of recommending a continuance and one opposed. So the motion carries. Thank you. Thank you. Chair, uh, can we actually read in item three and four together? Absolutely. Thank you. I see they're related. Right, I will read items, items three and four in together. Item three, George Bills requests a zone change from public facilities PF to Agriculture 1, A1.1, for 5.89 acres located at 1437 East 2300 North in the Rock Canyon neighborhood. And item four, George Bills requests concept plan approval for a three lot subdivision located at the 1437 East 2300 North in a proposed A1.1 zone. Subdivision approval is dependent on approval of a zone change from PF to A1.1, and this is the Rock Canyon neighborhood, and Mr. Ardmore will present these items. Thank you. I've done that twice now. Um, so here's the general area, uh, 2300 north as you go into the trailhead for Rock Canyon. This is Rock Canyon Park to the north of the subject property. Uh, currently, uh, the property is mostly vacant. There's an old ranger station here uh, that's still used for storage. Um, the proposal is to change the zone so that the applicant can subdivide it into three lots. Um, so the zone agricultural one acre lots uh, is what the zone would allow. Uh, the concept is actually providing three two acre lots, about two acre lots, uh, for three separate single family dwellings. You can hear, see here the zone map uh, to the west and the south of the subject property are residential zones. And then the general plan for this property is residential. Uh, staff reviewed this. Um, it seems to be a, a pretty simple zone request and concept plan. Uh, it, it makes sense for the area. Uh, continuing the kind of newer houses that have been moving up the street here, continuing that on. Um, it also is a benefit uh, that the developer is only requesting three lots here uh, when another request could have come in to be a much more uh, active and uh, dense development on what is a collector road um, could cause more problems with public works and engineering concerns. Um, so staff has reviewed the, the Proposal, it has gone through uh, the coordinator review committee and uh, we would recommend approval. And I'll take any questions that you have. Any questions? Are they, are they proposing to put the roads through to which, to 2530 or to? No, so they would still access off 2300 North, so it'd be three, 2300. probably two or three drives off to, to access those three properties. And I just had one question. Would A1.1 zoning permit the keeping of livestock of any kind? It would, to a limited degree, yeah. 
And would you foresee that being a problem to the surrounding residential uses? Um, not from what we've heard from the developer and um, the related property owner. Um, at most, horses, chickens, they're not, nobody's looking to do farming or ranching out here. Okay, thank you. Okay. Any other questions for Mr. Ardmore? If not, I'd like to invite the applicant, Mr. Bills, to present his case. Uh, my name's Dave Gardner. Mr. Bills is over there. He's too scared <laughs> to come before you after what you did to the last applicant. So, um, the uh, uh, the top topography kind of muddles the uh, the ge geologic study that was done. We have a fault line that runs right through here. Another one that runs right through here, and then we have a big one that comes all the way through there. So no uh, buildings that have human habitation can be built on those fault lines. Uh, so that kind of narrowed down the, the options in what we were trying to, to accomplish. Um, other than those fault lines, the, there's a little bit of topography change, but it's more interesting than it is problematic. So um, if, I, I don't know what else to say. If you have any questions, I'm happy to try to answer those. Any questions for the applicant? Seeing none, thank you. Okay. Do we have a neighborhood chair from the Rock Canyon neighborhood who would like to speak to this item? Do we have any other neighborhood chairs who would like to speak to this item? Any members of the community who would like to speak to this item? Please come forward, state your name, and sign in. Thank you. Uh, my name is Bruce Money, and uh, I am a, a citizen of Provo. Uh, first of all, Madam Chair and distinguished commissioners, thank you for your service to our city. Um, <clears throat> I'm a professor at, uh, at BYU in the business school. I am the owner of the uh, property just to the west of the subject property. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, my wife and I uh, built, that. oh, yep, there it is, the, oh, handy. First time I've done anything like this, so <laughs> excuse me, the, but uh, asked for comment, here I am. I own this house uh, right there, above the 2300. Um, we uh, met uh, with our neighborhood chair uh, in Mr. Ardmore's office with uh, Mr. Bills and Mr. Garner, and, um, it was not a contentious meeting at all. Uh, I think we're on the same page. We expressed a few concerns in the meeting. I'm here to express those concerns to the, to the commission um, if, uh, if this is the, the proper form. Um, the, uh, and I'm, I'm reading from your staff report here. Uh, analysis, uh, just a, a couple of things. The proposed zone would likely Limit the property to three lots, but the potential for five lots may be possible. I assume we're talking about three lots here, because we would not be in favor of five lots. Um, that would impact us more. Um, across the page, item F, adverse impacts on adjacent landowners. That's me. Um, there would be minimal adverse impacts to adjacent owners, but could include increased traffic and loss of view corridors. True, um, not so concerned about the, the traffic, but uh, the view corridors would be impacted. Well, that's uh, the way it goes when you have neighbors that build a house. We realize that. Uh, it it uh, comes down to us, uh, again, if this is the, the proper form, if not, I apologize, but where they end up putting the structures on these lots, particularly the one next to ours, uh, this is the structure that's existing on the lot that would be right next to ours, uh, the storage structure. Um, as I look at the topography, it seems like the land falls off here. And I realize, I realize there are the, the fault lines, and, and those are, are not places where you'd, you'd build. But um, if the new structure would be 
uh, right where the old structure is, if they were to replace it. I'm not saying they would or wouldn't or should or shouldn't, but that would be ideal because there's some trees there that kind of give privacy to this property owner There's some and, and privacy to us. If, on the other hand, the structure ended up here, uh, right next to our uh, recreation area that we've uh, developed there, we, we, this house is about uh, 18 months old, um, our uh, pergola uh, direct views into our kitchen, living room, family room, two bedrooms, uh, jacuzzi, I don't know. Uh, that would not be ideal if we could express that opinion at all. Um, and considering how I look in a swimsuit, that might be traumatic for the, the new owners as well. Um, <clears throat> little joke there, Madam Commissioner. Uh, that's uh, all I have to say. Uh, as I said, we, I understand um, they're developing these, say, say in the meeting for the, the Ronies, they would make fine neighbors. Uh, we know them personally from sports teams our kids have both played on. Um, no objections to, to the zoning. The, the, uh, I'll speak in favor of the agricultural uh, zoning, by the way, because we own chickens as well. And uh, if the horses ended up there, that'd be, that'd be great. So that's, that's my uh, two cents worth. I saw your postcard, came running, and that's, uh, that's all I have to say. Great, thank, thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Are there any other members of the public who would like to speak to this item? If not, I will turn it back over to the commission. So oh, time. sorry. <laughs> I don't see a pin here. Uh, I'm Jim Woodard. Um, I live uh, south of there and uh, actually right up against the Rock Canyon Mountain there. Um, I noticed in the report that the neighbors to the west were notified, but uh, I'm wondering why the neighbors on the south and even those of us that are further south were not notified. Uh, the way I found out about it was walking my dog, because I, I walk my dog down that road every day. Uh, my concern is that, uh, similar to what Mr. Money talked about, was the view. That's a beautiful view of Temp, uh, and the more houses that go up there, the less view we have for those of us that walk of Timpanoga. So I've been, actually been very pleased that this has been zoned the way that it is and hate to see it zoned as residential, especially if they put the houses right up against the road. So uh, I guess my question is, why weren't the people to the south and then those of us in the neighborhoods even further south that use that road a lot, not involved in the conversations that initially took place and I would hope that there would be some more discussion and uh, some more input from those of us that live there in the area. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Ardmore, would you like to address this concern? I could try to address that. Uh, so it's city policy that everyone within 500 feet of the subject property should receive a mailer, uh, a little postcard in the mail. Uh, outside of that 500 feet, it's up to the neighborhood chairs to notify of what's going on farther, further away. Yeah, also there's a sign note posted on the property. Isn't, aren't those people south within 500 feet? Of yeah. Yeah, so they should have been notified. They should have received postcards. I just wondered why it wasn't the documentation here. The neighbors to the west. We were, in the staff report, we were referencing uh, neighbors to the west because we've had a, they came to the city hall and had a discussion with us. Yeah. Thank you. Are there any other members of the public who would like to speak to this item? And please state your name and sign in for the record. My name is Vicki Aida. And what else do you want to know? Uh, uh, there's a sign in sheet. Oh, well, I actually don't. Is this, where's the pen? Um, I don't have any strong feelings one way or the other. I don't know where a pen is. <laughs> They're getting one for you. Okay. And so I just came here mostly for information. I live directly across the street, and I don't know how to show that. But anyway, uh, oh, does that do something? I don't know. Anyway, I live right exactly across the street. And so I guess that was, I came here hoping to find out, okay, what is the plus, what is the negative? For me, one of the pluses is that it is only three houses and 
it's not some great big high density thing because then I would be like, no, no. So I think that's probably improving it. And, and I'm not sure, I guess my question is, how big can these houses be? You know, are they going to be just so mammothly big and huge that, you know, it will hinder, you know, my view when I look out the window and, you know, I like to see the mountains and everything. I guess I'm just kind of curious, what are the, are there any rules to that or? I don't yes. know. Thank yeah. you. Uh, so maximum height of 35 feet, uh, that's actually measured at the midpoint of the roof. Uh, so not a very tall structure and um, is that your only question? I, I, I think so I mean just you know the footprint is also limited by your by your yard setbacks okay will it be more set back or how are they planning on it and that's one other you address the the fault lines because you know every year I see the geology class from BYU come and they're all there looking at the faults and I was thinking how are they gonna build that so they're just going to kind of do it in a way that the houses are somehow situated back and the fault lines are somehow avoided, something like that. I, I would assume okay. such. So for me, living across the street, what could be the negative besides the house being so huge that you know it blocks the view? Are there any other things that I should be concerned of that I'm so inexperienced I don't know of? Or uh, Not that I can think of, but okay. that's just my No, Also, are these, I believe this land was owned by the Ronies. Is it for the Roney children, or are these lots open for other people? You don't know that? I, I, don't, I don't have information Good. on that. Okay. All right. I think that's about all I had to say. Do you want my address down here, too? So I'm 14. Oh, two, east. I wasn't planning on getting up and speaking, but they weren't addressing all my questions. So thank you. <laughs> thank you. Are there any other members of the public who would like to speak to this item? Seeing none, we will close this to public comment and turn it back over to the commissioners for discussion and or a motion. And uh, just as a reminder, we'll be making a recommendation on item three and approving or denying or continuing item four. Maybe it's a, a question for the developer here. Uh, these lots are now going into agricultural one, and some of these lots are are large enough in size that that they could actually be divided legally. Yeah. And uh, and with a little work, you could uh, you could make the three lots so they couldn't be. I think um, a little work in the layout of the lot, so they could only be three lots. Yeah, they could still be three lots, but less than two acres on each one. Mm -hmm. And then you would, and then when there would only ever be three lots. Okay. Well, I, I'd be happy to look at that, but I can tell you right now that there's only going to be three lots. I can't tell you. How, what house, what size the houses are because we haven't gotten that far, but uh, the three lots is all that's going to be there. And part of the item, just as a reminder, for uh, item four would be to approve or disapprove the site plan as it's as it's shown in the map. But Commissioner Phillips, I'd be happy to to look at how to do that. Are you are you thinking about moving the lot lines around a little bit just so that each one is just under two acres? Well, I just looked at just shifting it just a little bit, and you'd be under and we two. can do that. That's something we could do. That's not. We got so much room there that we can move those lot lines around if that makes somebody if that makes you more comfortable, and I'm okay with that. We could make that a condition of the um, site plan approval. Any other comments, discussion from the commissioners? Thank you, sir. I'd like to make a motion. Mr. Rowan? I move that we forward a positive recommendation uh, to the Municipal Council um, concerning George Bill's request for a zone change from public facilities to Agricultural One for 5.89 acre, acres located at 1437 East, 2300 North in the Rock Canyon neighborhood. And did you want to include item four in your motion? 
I'll just make a motion on item three. Okay. Yeah. Very good. Do we have a second for Mr. Rowan's motion on item three? Second. Seconded by Mr. Smith. All those in favor of forwarding a positive recommendation to Municipal Council for item three? Aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, the motion carries unanimously. That leaves us with item four, and we will be approving or disproving this item. Any discussion, comments, motion? I, you know, I didn't quite follow uh, the logistics of your suggestion, so I'm not sure. <clears throat> I can make this make the motion if there's not any other communications that are questions that anyone has. Ms. Alsworth. Oh, I think the question was um, you were proposing that we alter or that the developer alter the lot sizes incrementally so that they're just below two acres so that would what bar them from being further subdivided right in the zone that we just approved and is there any potential for a flag lot in the future in this zone yes okay so that's some the concern is real but if they're under two acres, they can they couldn't be subdivided for a flat Correct. lot. Okay, that helps. So are we ready for a motion? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Do it. Okay, I'll do it. Um, I make a motion that uh, we we recommend that that they redesign the the lots so that they're. They're equally just under two acres. And uh, with that, uh, make approval that we, we let them move on to the, to the council. Uh, we're actually design. approving or disapproving the site plan. And we're approving with, with the idea that they make that. So, so you, would rec you would make a, a motion to approve with the conditions, including the one that you. Right. So each parcel would be less than two acres, thereby prohibiting any future subdivision. Right. Is that correct? Okay. Do we have a second to Mr. Phillips' motion? I'll second that. Seconded by Ms. Ellsworth. All those in favor of approving item four with the conditions read in by Mr. Phillips? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right, it passes unanimously with those conditions. I think you'll be okay. All right. We will read in item five now. Uh, there's a possibility we may lose one of our commissioners. Mr. Smith has a, a previous engagement. Uh, if so, we still have a quorum for the, this evening's hearing. Item five, the West Side Citizen Advisory Committee requests a general plan amendment for adoption of a new future land use map that includes Provo City lands west of the I-15 freeway and south of the Provo River. This affects Lakewood, Sunset, Provo Bay, and Fort Utah neighborhoods. And this item will be presented by Mr. Maxfield. I'll, I'll present it if that's all right. Thank you. I'll be very brief, uh, as brief as I can. Uh, <laughs> um, this is the culmination of many months of work. We have uh, quite a few members of the steering committee for the West Side present uh, tonight. And so if I get something wrong or leave something out, please jump up and correct me. But just a couple of major points I'd like to make is that the thing that has made development of the west side or planning of the west side difficult is that we have very diverse interest groups uh, with different visions for the west side this plan is a, an attempt to listen to all of those different groups and try to in some way um, appease or handle or, or do something that um, they seem to be advocating 
Now, in one hand, you can say that's the strength of the plan that we're trying to appease all these different groups. In another way, that might be a weakness of the plan because sometimes the quickest path to failure is trying to please everybody. So I don't know, uh, we'll have to see how this goes. We did have this open for public input for, for a couple of months on City View. Um, we did receive uh, about 50 comments from the public and this plan that actually ended up getting tweaked based on those comments that we received. The steering committee did go through those comments and made some additional changes. Just very briefly, what we're proposing is to stay approximately the same in the total number of dwelling units on the west side as the original 2010 master plan that called for just four units to the acre over everything that wasn't in the airport overlay area. The reason why we wanted to try to do that is to get enough rooftops on the west side to encourage some commercial amenities, which was another goal of one of those groups. But instead of just having four units to the acre spread over the entire area, we tried to cluster that in order to achieve some other goals or ends. By taking some of that density and putting it in higher density nodes along the parkway or up on Center Street, it allows us to get different housing product types in the area and different price points, and hopefully some more affordable units than what would go into just the four unit per acre areas. Under, in today's situation, today's economy, I think that it's very likely that the houses built in this four unit per acre area could end up with lot prices somewhere between one hundred and one hundred fifty thousand dollars for the lot. It means the house price is probably going to be about four times that. In order to offset that high price point, that's a reason for these other higher density nodes here and there. The current general plan, the two thousand ten general plan, doesn't call for any preservation of farmland north of the road, north of Lakeview Parkway. This calls for some agricultural preservation north of the road. That's to appease that group that would like a large part of this or all of it to remain in agricultural preservation. Um, we've taken kind of the next step of the 2010 general plan, which identifies this as a commercial area and either under, under current zoning or under non-conforming uses that are there and said that really is a smart place for some type of village center, some type of commercial and mixed use area that would be a higher intensity node, you know, for the entire west side. If there's commercial potential, the two places where it's probably most likely would be there or right by the new interchange here. That's 24 acres of commercial that's been recommended there. Um, these nodes in this lighter color, those are possible commercial nodes. We're anticipating that the language of the plan that would come forward to you, back to you, after this is adopted or some form of this is adopted by the city council, the language of that plan would describe what we're envisioning here. But that would say you'd have the potential for commercial type retail, but it wouldn't mandate that you have to do that. Um, we did receive you know, input from the neighbor chair, the neighbor chair of Lakeview, Lakewood, recently saying she would, her neighborhood would recommend that that commercial node be moved to 1600 west rather than 12th west. Um, she had some good reasons for that. I would agree with those. On the other hand, if I could see um, justification for commercial nodes on every one of those. Yeah. Yeah. Um, collector class roads or arterial class roads coming into an arterial class road. Um, this color, of course, is airport uh, overlay, uh, commercial industrial uses that were that are in some way supportive of the airport. The city has under, is under contract to buy this property for the regional park right now. So that's gotten to be a given or a known while, we're, while we've been in this planning process. 
So that's some of the thinking that's gone on. The, the number of units under this plan, I think, is within five. It's five units more than the previous four units to the acre over the entire plan. Um, so that's in a nutshell what thinking went into this. Again, we I specifically asked members of the steering committee to be here tonight to help answer questions you may have or to help answer questions the public may have. Um, that's where we are today. Thank you. Commissioners, any questions for Mr. Pepperoni? Yes, I have a question. Mr. Nitz. Uh, we live in that zone, in that area, and uh, the way that you have it planned here, we're in a, we're in a, now in agriculture, you're changing it to an RES zone. Uh, we do not want to be put in a zone that would cause us to lose green belt it would cause us to lose animal rights. I have sons that want to continue to farm. So does changing it to the RES zone do anything to that? Thank you for asking that. I should have mentioned that. So in neighborhood plans, when we put forward a land use map and a new neighborhood plan, we never initiate any zone changes based on that map. We allow um, the property owners continue to do what they would like to do, use their property the way it is used now. It's only when property owners come in and ask for a rezone, the rezones would start to take place. But the idea would be that the rezone should follow whatever this map ends up being as decided by the city council. The idea would be that those rezones would be consistent with the map. That one, one of the points we're trying to make in neighborhood plans is we're trying to take the controversy out of future development. And if we can go through a neighborhood planning process and come up with a map that has got generally neighborhood support, the idea is to take the controversy out of those development issues and development questions. So this would not change anybody's zoning. Any other questions for Mr. Pepperoni? Yeah, what did you say the home values would be? In talking to the developers that have looked at west side properties between the current land price the infrastructure costs, um, uh, city impact fees, all of those things you go into coming up with the price of a lot, uh, up between $100,000 and $150,000 per lot for this lowest density area, which would be four units to the acre, and it's still yet to be decided by your recommendation and ultimately by the city council if that four, rec four units to the acre should mean four units to the acre gross or four units to the acre net. Remember that in Provo City, our subdivision streets take up about 30% of a property. So when you do four units to the acre gross, you end up with a lot of six and 8,000 square foot lots. When you do four units to the acre net, you end up with a lot of 10 and 12,000 square foot lots. It ends up being about a unit per acre difference. You're about 2.8 to four. That's the difference, that's the swing between for gross and for net. I have a question, a couple questions. Mr. Rowan. Um, as I look at the um, map here, I only see, it, I'm, I think I'm only seeing one location that has an MDR, uh, and then the majority of those that are higher than your uh, you know, RES are LDRs. Can you talk to us a little bit about that you know why why is there no why isn't there more MDR why isn't there any H uh, high density residential uh, it seems that there might be you know as we think about again spreading I know that we want to locate most of our high density residential medium density residential downtown but you know is to what degree was that explored I mean it seems like there might be appropriate places where the west side could. Uh, have some of that, especially to, to help achieve its, some of its goals of having commercial uh, out there. So I'd love to just a little bit more information about that, and then I'll ask my second question. After. Mr. Newsom, would you pass those down? What Mr. Newsom is passing down is an email I received from Max Carter today. He's a significant landowner on the west side, and a, a lot of his email there gives history of the west side. On the second page, there's an underlined paragraph, and that's where he really starts to give some land use recommendations. But he's, uh, as a uh, farmer of the area, property owner of the area, he's suggesting that there be more higher density areas, uh, specifically along Geneva Road, or the continuation of Geneva Road. Um, I think the planning staff would be comfortable with some higher density areas. What we're trying to balance, though, is 
some strong neighborhood opposition to um, to doing that, uh, even to you know suggest these nodes here um, and some of those comments we received while it was on Open City Hall. You know, there were those uh, and a significant number of those who thought we were put bringing too much density into the west side. I think another way to look at this would be to add some higher density areas and create some even more other lower density density areas. Uh, for a greater variety, but um, we we're trying to balance those people who get very nervous anytime a density is more than four units to the acre on the west side with those property owners who would like to sell their land for higher values and higher densities. It's, it's a balancing act, yeah. and it's a, it's a difficult balancing act. Yeah, and I think that, I mean, as a, as a planning commission who's thinking about um, the larger context of the entire city uh, you know I, I certainly understand that the kind of conversation that happens in when you're really focused on you know an individual region or an individual neighborhood or you know sets of neighborhoods and and I get that uh, and that my response would be again implicit in what I the, the very question that I asked which is that it does seem that there are places that thinking across the city um, and even thinking about some of the objectives that the plan has in it to have more commercial nodes and so forth where medium, more medium or even some high density residential would be appropriate. It seems that, that right at that interchange, um, I don't have a pointer here, but where you have the commercial in the, in the lower right hand corner. That's a point for students. Oh, oh, here's one. Oh, sorry. There were lots of them. You know, this seems like a no-brainer, in, in terms of thinking again citywide, this seems like a no-brainer space to have slightly higher um, uh, density uh, residential. It seems like, um, you know, even even here, right? So this space, why not have just a little bit more? That That's not going to, you know, if the concerns are about traffic or other things, my sense is that people who would live here would mostly access we would be living there to access I-15 um, and to, to get places. Um, and then I, I agree with uh, Geneva, which would continue what happens further north along Geneva, you know, maybe higher density. I, you know, I, th I think that, sorry, Shannon, <laughs> just lasered you. Um, or even, you know, along this stretch, you know, an occasional MDR. Um, I, again, I understand the opposition. I understand the balancing act. And th so this is this would be my response as a member of the larger city um, that that would make sense to me and I would I would just strongly encourage uh, us as a city to to consider that. So I'd like to when you open this up I'd like to allow members of the committee to answer that or give your opinion of that. But on a former plan I know that one was LDR we um, MDR we may have had MDR there I'm not sure but I know we had MDR there. What happened was because of the elevation of this area, a lot of fill is going to have to be brought in. The site's going to have to be raised, just like the site was raised for this subdivision, the Osprey subdivision. So first of all, the land itself is going to have to be raised. Then with an MDR zone allowing a 45-foot building height, this neighborhood was worried about the eventual height of those structures, you know, looking down into their neighborhood. So they asked, or I asked them, you know, their opinion of this, they suggested lowering that to LDR and creating a new LDR node here to offset the loss in density. <clears throat> One of the things also we were trying to achieve is to spread that around. This is Lakewood neighborhood, so they were getting their higher densities. This is Sunset, is in Sunset the next neighborhood. They were getting their share, and this is, no. Port. This is Provo Bay, and Provo Bay was getting theirs, and this is, Fort Utah, and they were getting theirs. So it was spreading that around in that way. Um, one, of, one of your points, Jamin, I think is valid in that. You'll see that we've got a commercial node here, and we've buffered it with some higher density. We didn't do that there. I can't articulate a good reason why we did here and not there. Perhaps some members of the steering committee can shed some light on that. So um, anyway. I, yeah, I one, of the, I, one of the implications is that the neighborhood would allow a low density mix with that residential so I'm not sure if that was part of it. 
And I, I mean, as you point that out, I mean, that is certainly one thing I like about the, pl the plan is the spread. Um, I think that's great. And again, I understand that some of the concerns um, about looking down into um, backyards or um, or certainly the, the, the kind of topography argument makes the most sense of any of the arguments. Um, I, you know, so I understand the hesitancy, I understand the concerns. It just seems to me, um, again, that maybe they're, if, you know, I'm not, I don't know that I'd suggest every LDR being an MDR or HDR, but maybe, uh, you know, taking a few of those and, and making them MDR um, or, or HDR. And, yeah, so. That's just my immediate response. I mean, I like, again, I like the spread. My, my next question was uh, just about the agriculture. Can you just tell us a little bit more about why there? I mean, I notice it's next to the new school. Um, oh, is that, sorry. It, we're still way south of the school. We're way south of the school still, okay. So this is, so this um, is largely, um, the former neighborhood chair, whose property is that? Thank you, Harry McCord's property. The other one is, No. we can just go back to the map, that would be great. Um, one was largely Harry McCord's property, that's the north part of the Hinckley property. Right. Um, so those are you know, long time agricultural people who we felt like we were protecting their agricultural interests. That's why those landed there. So it's more to do with the particular owners than with uh, location that... Yes. Okay. Yeah, a lot of these lower density nodes were re in response to specific property owners. This is where Dave Arnold lives. That's a half acre subdivision that's zoned RA right now. Um, that's Mr. Morgan's property there and there. Um, so some of those were in response to either what's on the ground right now or what property owners themselves wanted. Were those two agricultural parcels we were just discussing, they're also in the airport zone, correct? Yeah, that, that's also... So they're restricted, what you can build there? That's right, yeah. yeah. You see the cross hats very lightly on those parcels. But again, in steering committee people, if I get something wrong, jump up and correct me. Any more questions for Mr. Pepperoni? No. I have a comment, maybe. Yes. To start, before we get uh, our neighborhood chairs and those people who had an opportunity to sit on this steering committee, um, we have a, a small amount of property that we have in agricultural one. There's 12 acres on 3110 right along that side. And, and I've had an opportunity to speak with with all of those owners plus the owners on the next 40 acres of property that was on that section. But, but in reality, there's, there's really only one home on 3110 that, that could be subdivided and split so there would be two, two lots. And the family's in a position where they're, they're hoping that they might be able to have a son build a home and uh, be able to help them. They're kind of bedridden people. And, and so uh, the idea to, to think about changing that to an RA zone, and, uh, and that would allow them to do that. So also, that, that 40 acres that we put there, we talked about the density on that road and the possibility of changing that to, to an RA as well. And, and most of the people there, that's what they've been doing, and and they were all pretty. Uh, well, they they were all in favor of that that zoning instead of the new. Uh, what is it? Two point eight acres, two point eight houses per acre. I guess it would be to two acre, two houses to the acre. Yeah. So just to clarify, the RA zone is twenty thousand square feet per lot. So that would be a slight increase in density here and then a decrease in density there. I think that's a good suggestion, but I'd love to hear members of the steering committee respond to that when this is opened up. Ms. Ellsworth. Uh, Bill and Brian, this plan is very detailed, and I understand that it's to, um, I guess, prevent future 
controversy. But are there other advantages to having a plan this detailed? Where it, I mean, it's down to the, you know, precise acreage, very precise acreage. I think a lot of the acreage was so we could show the shift of the population and, and the numbers to show that uh, it's really responding to, even to the current general plan, you know, in terms of numbers. It wasn't, uh, you know, it's just really laying out the acreages for those pods, not the overall acreages for those zones. Southeast plan had very detailed areas also, you know, for uh, what could happen. I think the difference between those plans, you're dealing with vacant ground. In the neighborhood plans, you're doing infill for the most part. This area has uh, uh, close to 50% of the vacant ground in the whole city, you know, is in this area. And it does not show, however, areas that really aren't open to development. We really did focus on just the areas that could be really developed. It doesn't have the areas to the south. Again, those are more sensitive lands. Uh, certainly they're intended to be included that way and continue that way. But it gets confusing to show, I think, all of those areas that you're really not looking to develop in the future, the airport and some of those other things, at least different than what they are now. So it really emphasizes more the future development of areas that are not developed now or underdeveloped something. The acreages were just put on to help us calculate dwelling units so we could have that comparison. Any other questions from the commissioners? If not, I'd like to invite the Westside Citizen Advisory Committee to come forward, or a representative, or all of them, or? We do have some neighbor chairs. <clears throat> I'm sorry? We do also have some neighbor chairs here. Just a few uh, general comments to some questions that have come up. Um, and first, an overarching comment, uh, if I may. Um, wanted to underscore the weight or the amount of time that went into this. Um, you know, I spent a lot of, we spent a lot of hours in a room with Mr. Pepperoni when we would have rather been at home with our families, and so I don't want that time, uh, no offense to Mr. Pepperoni, he's a nice guy to My spend time with. I that I was with you. So. Indeed. <laughs> State your name, please. Oh, sorry, Aaron McCullough. I'll sign in here in a minute. Um, so, just wanted to paint the picture that this has um, taken a lot of time and, and not just watching the clock go around, that, that's the passage of time, but that we took a lot of time to um, read every comment from the public uh, comment period. Uh, the, the committee was made up of, is made up of um, some small landowners, some large landowners. Everyone lives on the west side um, and I don't feel that it was the closest or the fastest way to failure, um, as uh, he alluded to earlier, that sometimes can happen. Um, as a member of the committee, I, I want to let you know who weren't you know, in these meetings um, that, that at least I feel that this is a very good result of the time that was spent on it. Um, were there a few questions that, that you had that Mr. Pepperoni didn't so answer or couldn't James, remember. Anything you want to add to Jamin's question about why not higher densities in some other areas? Um, is this that. okay? The question was asked about this spot right here. Is that uh, 2050 and 600? Yes. Okay. Um, if the question was why wasn't there a higher density there? Um, and I believe that was because there's existing, you know, there are existing homes here you know, a quarter, third acre lot, homes uh, right along there, and that wouldn't have been uh, appropriate, we felt, uh, in that spot. Um, whereas, uh, you know, we can design it in down here much more easily because we can design all uh, at the same time what's going to be next to it and plan versus here, uh, we need to be deferential to, you know, the existing homes that are there. Was but, there another thing, it, Commissioner Rowan? Yeah, I'll, I'll ask, uh, I'll kind of re re repeat some of the other areas that I was talking about, but it, wouldn't, wouldn't one say that that's the case with everything here, that there's an existing land use already in place um, and that everything that you've mapped up here um, is 
or, or nearly everything is is kind of overlap or, or is imposing a new zone upon what already exists so that in other words this wouldn't have to change until you know either the market made it possible for it to change you know to, to so if if at some point land became valuable enough that someone came in and said hey it's worth it's worth the money to buy these uh you know this property and and you know make it low density or, or medium density i mean I believe at one point we had it uh, on there, and <clears throat> again with the con you know consideration of of all of the all of the input, um, I do remember moving it, um, and it wasn't on a whimsy. Um, but I'm sorry, I can't give you more. Yeah, no, I mean, and that, and that was less less. I mean, uh, Mr. Pepperoni raised that question. My uh, question was about why. Uh, I would like to just a little bit more info uh, about why not slightly higher densities in certain places uh, here. Why why is everything that's above the, your uh, residential uh, kind of RES um, and RAs, everything low, LDR with the exception of one MDR here? Um, and I... Uh, I can't speak to that in specifics except to echo, I think, what Ms. Pepperoni was getting to earlier, which was we're really trying to stay within the density, the overall density. Um, you know, so it's, some of it just comes down to arithmetic. Um, but, but also um, the West Side goals and policies that were adopted by the City Council a year, 18 months ago, said townhouse type product was okay, but nothing stacked. Hmm. Okay. So I didn't have any other particularly uh, wonderful comments to make. So I hope my question my doesn't come across as antagonistic. I'm, not, I'm, I'm just not at all. Know, and I appreciate. I'm, I'll say one more thing. I guess that's coming to mind is the, um, which is why I was pleased to be a part of this process. Is as as I've been involved in the neighborhood chair and vice chair. Um, activities of having developers come and want to um, put in their development and, and get comments and it, it has been a frustrating process on both sides because they've come with an expectation uh, and the neighborhood has come with a different expectation. Uh, the reason that I have been pleased to be part of this process is I feel like this will Reduce. I don't want to say eliminate, not a Pollyanna, but I think it will reduce significantly um, the the disconnect and the expectations of both both sides. So, well, thanks for your work. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm, I'm not going to say, well, first of all, I'm Jonathan Hill. I happen to be the Fort, Fort Utah Neighborhood Chair. I also did serve on the committee as well. Um, I'll fill this in at the end as well. Um, I just wanted to add some kind of personal experience I've had, both personally and as a neighborhood chair, to what Aaron was saying about the feelings out there. Um, the first one is, uh, you know, I became a professor at BYU three years ago. We were looking to move to the area. Um, and my wife first said, skip Provo. I don't want to live in Provo. And when she was saying that, she was thinking about when we were students at BYU and what Provo is like over in this area with the big streets, the busy roads, um, large public transportation, all of these kinds of things. Then I talked her into looking at a house that we saw way over here, uh, kind of on the western edge of what has developed so far. Um, and she said, this is a different Provo to me. And this is a kind of story that I hear over and over on the west side, that the west side has a distinct feel from downtown Provo. And you could say that about a lot of different neighborhoods, right? The tree streets feel different than Provost, which feels different than downtown, which feels different than the river bottoms, right? And I think it's a strength of Provo that we have these different kinds of environments. On the west side, the general feeling is that we would like somewhere that's quieter, more open, less dense than the other parts of Provo. And I think there's some good reasons for that. Uh, environmentally speaking, we talk about average miles traveled, those kinds of things. We want to reduce traffic, provide, uh, you talked about transportation-oriented development, those kinds of things. 
We have almost no public transportation out here, period. And even adding little MDR zones, I don't think will create the densities that you need for a strong, viable public transportation. And so the, the solution to that, that, if you read the literature over and over again, is to cluster your high densities around those transportation corridors that we have very, very well developed now with UVX and Front Runner in downtown Provo, and then allow the kind of lower density out here to minimize those miles traveled. Um, also, the experience of talking to my neighbors about what, uh, what kinds of developments were coming in here, I will tell you, we are kind of pushing the edge, I think, of the density that will not cause the neighborhood to all pack this room and complain about it. Um, when we, I would poll people, about 50% would say it was too dense. Most, uh, most of the rest would say that it's just right, and a few people would say it's not dense enough. And so I think we're hitting that kind of middle uh, where we've compromised on the density in the area. Specific nodes, you mentioned uh, MDR or HDR in this area, that there wasn't any traffic concerns. There's not traffic concerns along Lakeview Parkway, but I'm sure Becky can speak to this. There's huge traffic concerns along 500 West which also leads into town. It's becoming a corridor, however, it actually is a residential collector road with houses facing the street, driveways, et cetera. Um, the city has also made mistakes in the past, I think. They allowed houses to face Center Street, um, which put a bunch of driveways there. That limits the traffic load that road can handle. Um, there's houses all along 600 South. Over and over again, the infrastructure cannot handle the higher loads. As nice as it might be to find some nodes and put it out there, the infrastructure is just not there because of past decisions that were made. Finally, I just want to share an experience that happened just yesterday. Uh, this is a development that we'll see if it comes through in the near future. Um, we had a developer that had purchased the land right here, um, right across or right next to the ropes course uh, area there, kind of west of the new Lakeview Parkway. Uh, they came in, and I will tell you, they did a very good job of working with the neighborhood and getting something that matched the new plan. Their densities are four units per acre uh, as a net, actually, four units per acre. Uh, they put light industrial airport related on the south side of the road, residential on the north side of the road. They quoted a price point of about $350,000 uh, for their homes, and the neighborhood voted unanimously to support that proposal, okay? This is in far contrast with a previous proposal that came in in this area, and they wanted to put a mixture of townhomes and 4,000 square foot lots, kind of a higher density. They originally wanted an LDR zone, for example, um, and they uh, faced drastic or huge resistance from the neighborhood. Uh, in fact, the neighborhood voted unanimously not to support that one. And so we're seeing that we've hit a point where we can get the neighborhood on board and allow some of this development to occur. And if we try to push it higher densities, I don't think the neighborhood's gonna support us in that. So do you guys have any other questions for me? Any questions for Mr. Hill? Mm. Yeah. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Let me sign this. Are there any other neighborhood chairs <clears throat> present who would like to address this item? Oh, sorry. Thank you. Didn't realize there were more still here. <laughs> Tom Halliday, uh, committee member, uh, West Side Committee. Uh, I concur with a lot of what's been said. I have been, uh, uh, people have come to me that said they didn't get an opportunity to, to state their feelings um, and concerns. Uh, while this was going on, um, I don't know exactly what what their miss was, why they missed it, but uh, a few of them have said that they would like higher density uh, in the area. Um, it would be along that Geneva Road and the corridor area, which might be a little bit more viable and, and work in that area. Um, but for the most part, uh, the feeling is, is is people like that more rural look and the uh, and the uh, keeping with the uh, the general plan that was set forth before uh, of the of the lower density. Um, so that's kind of what we were trying to 
keep our concepts with and 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 I think we took a a great look at trying to allow and keep people happy a lot of talk and a lot of uh, understanding was put into f the feeling of the property owners which I really respect and and appreciate from Bill and and the group um, there was uh, there is some uh, some development that is being looked at that's in that A110 area along here that uh, that I was told and understood that if it came along that there would be a opportunities to make the change because it is in the airport related area and it does relate to that area so I would assume that the opportunities are still there. Do you mean airport related up in this area? Yes. Um, we should make that change on this map at some point uh, before the city council sees it, I think, if uh, if that's what's recommended. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm recommending that that there be some some opportunity for for this area in here uh, to be uh, put into the airport uh, compatible industry. Um, there's there is property owners that would like to work within that area and, and be allowed to uh, look at those options. So uh, other than that, I, I don't know if you have any questions for me. Any questions for Mr. Halliday? No. Thank you so much. Thank Tom, you. Yep. What's your Go feeling ahead. about the overall plan? Do you think it's a good plan? I think it's a good plan. I think that uh, a lot of effort and a lot of care for concept and, and trying to respect neighborhoods and, and people's feelings, um, trying not to get so dense that people felt like they were being overcome by large high structures. I thought I think there's a lot of uh, respect for people's feelings there. I, th I think they're trying to meet that, yes. Any other questions for Mr. Halliday? Yeah, I have a question. You had just mentioned that uh, there was some interest. Um, yeah, there was some interest in continuing the airport compatible industrial and commercial zone right there south of center on the far west side where you just pointed. Yes, and, in, um, in this area here. Yep, exactly. So right now that's an A1 you know, uh, area. I'm kind of questioning now like why why wasn't it or why isn't it or why couldn't it be industrial or commercial is that what you're proposing is that what the committee's pro proposing yeah. and i'm saying it could be i would suggest i would suggest that what i'm hearing tonight is to change this area to ra right. change this area to airport related okay. so i would suggest let's listen to the rest of the public input yeah. but probably what we should do is bring back to you a map with whatever changes come out of this meeting and Okay. Bring that back to you. That's helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other neighborhood chairs present who would like to speak to this item? Ellis <laughs> Landon. Beth Alligood, Southwest Area Representative. I was also a member of the committee. I have to my address. Fortunately, my address is great. It's 1234 North. People think I'm lying, but I'm not. Um, I, I want to hit on your high density residential real quick on that. Uh, I actually, through this whole process, one of my biggest things that I fought for was to get the MDR zone up there to pull density away from other areas on this map. Uh, one of the things that people really want in this area that when I've gone out and talked to people a lot is they want to have that sense of community in the area. They want to have that sense of preserving what West Provo is. 
And that's why we also, if you look on the map, you can see dotted green lines along some of the new roads. One of the things we also push to kind of keep that sense of open space and sense of community is a trail system throughout the area that could have wayfaring points, that could have other points there to keep that openness, walkability, recreational, just the sense of this is a different part of Provo. We're not downtown. We don't want, you know, six story apartment buildings all out there. We don't want to be by BYU where we're housing students and we're transient the whole time. We want a calmer side of Provo that, like in Jonathan's case, that's what people look for in cities sometimes. They don't want to live downtown. They want that calmer side. And if you look at most of the development that's been approved in the city in the last couple of years, it's all been apartment buildings. It's been apartment buildings. It's been townhomes. It's been higher density. And while I'm not, I would really love to see a map, and Bill, maybe you could do this, of what the percentage of apartments versus single family residents versus townhomes is in the entire city and how that spread out through the city. I think we made some great compromises with LDR zones along the parkway. Uh, the parkway is a fast, easy transit route that does not bring congestion into the neighborhoods. The MDR zone up on Geneva and Center Street right to the freeway and we're not getting that traffic. We don't have public transit out there. We don't have infrastructure out there. We don't have amenities out there. And even with this map, if it was built exactly as it is and filled to capacity, I don't think you would get a lot of that out there anyway because it's just not an area that seems to draw in things like that. We have the high school out there now. And let me tell you, as the neighborhood chair for Lakeview North in that high school, I constantly get, when are we getting commercial out there? And I tell them, you're not. It's not coming to that area, and it's not coming anytime soon, especially with the sewer problems that we're having. Nothing is going to be built out there for the next two to five years without some major issues being dealt with. So I think this is a great thing to pass, put on the books to say, hey, do I think this is the end? I don't think this is the end, honestly, because in five years' time, as the economy changes, as sentiment changes, as things change, which change is inevitable, people are going to ask for changes on this too. And I will be up here at that point in time, again, saying, with whatever changes you're doing, we still want to preserve that part of Provo and the feeling that people get when they come to that part of Provo. So the compromise of the LDR zone, the MDR zone, you get your higher density, but then you still preserve that neighborhood feeling and that sense of community in the area. Do you have any other questions for me? Any questions for Ms. Allgood? No. no. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, I'm going to address... Could you please state your name for the record? Becky Bogdan, Lakewood Neighborhood Chair. Okay, so I'm going to address by the freeway, because that is us. Um, first of all, I've been here before telling you guys that we do sit six to seven feet below where they will start. <laughs> They're starting elevation. They have to bring in a county worth of fill, literally, to build that up, because it is in the active FEMA flood zone. So they have to build that up, and according to what Dave Decker has told me, that's a foot below that dike. That is six to seven feet above where my house sits. <laughs> so you're already setting a good one story, all right, and then you're going to go further. Also right there on Fifth West, just right up above that, that is where the boulders are. We all know that the boulders are such a hard area. It's not just the boulders, it's also the two plexes, the four plexes, the trailer parks. That area is broken up into three different elementary schools because it is so hard. That is one reason why they grab this triangle piece down here and stick it all the way up to Franklin. My neighborhood's actually split in between two elementary schools. And these homes down here are starter homes. They are three bedroom rambler homes. We struggle to fill church callings. We are not very rich people. And then just right north of us, we're also mixed with the hardest part of Provo. So to have more apartments there, we, we can't absorb that. And so my comments 
was why don't we stick it someplace where you're going to build more residential that could absorb that better than right there on that corner. Um, because honestly, we just cannot absorb it. We cannot fill church callings in our ward. They've even reboundaried us. We still cannot do it. I talked to the principal at the elementary school, and she's like, oh, Becky, please, please. I need stable families. I cannot deal with any more than what I've got right now because Franklin Elementary is a very poor school. Um, and so that is my concern there is, honestly, my neighborhood, that area, we cannot absorb more. Over on 1100, that's a little bit easier to absorb. However, my problem with 1100 is, um, I do have my notes here. Back on June 12th of 2018, the Provo School District had their Facilities Advisory Committee present to them, and the number one preferred place to move Dixon Junior High is right there by Footprinters Park, right up 1100 West. I have a pointer where you could... Is there a pointer here? Should be. Uh, yeah, well, it's up a little bit more. It's going to be right off 11th. And they are talking about taking some of the existing park that's right there to accommodate that 15 acres that they need for that junior high. So my friend that is on that committee, she said, Becky, with the growth of the west side, this will cut down their transportation costs to move it there. And it will be walking for quite a bit of the kids there. So to have that little note there on the, the little corner, um, concerns me. I do realize we're going to get traffic from people dropping off their children, but to have extra traffic for gas station, grocery, or whatever. Um, I also have, yeah, yeah. I also have um, the little thing done for the police department when they were putting out about, hey, it's it's you know on their Facebook page. Um, they did say that a recent study has shown that children under 14 years old tend to lack both judgment and motor skills to safely cross busy streets. So, you know, your eighth graders, some of them are 14, some of your ninth graders are 14. Um, that is a concern, and that's why I would rather have that move to a different location rather than right there on that corner. Also, just right close to that is our stake center. We have two LDS churches up that street. Um, and we all know that kids will walk to Mutual every week <laughs> with all of that draw. Um, that road also dead ends on 6 South, and we all know 6 South's the railroad tracks, right? <laughs> you can't really get out of there. Um, <laughs> so those are some of the neighborhood concerns um, about why that wouldn't be the most great place to have that. Um, I did get approached by the people that are looking at purchasing. I think they have a purchase option on that place over there in the corner. Um, my conversations with them, they do not think that a big box, anything, 24 acres of commercial is viable. They don't want, and she's here, I'm sure. She told me she'd be here. I don't know who she is, but um, they, they don't see it as a viable option. They are looking at reducing that to 12 acres, and that is something that the neighborhood would like. And um, she's proposing some of the same things that would go into that 1100 West portion. And so to have two of those in the neighborhood, I just don't know that that's viable either. Um, 500 West on the southern portion is 40 feet wide, five inches. So you can tell these streets, a lot of them aren't streets, they're alleyways. <laughs> and so that is a problem. And I do have two miles of pure residential up that street. That is 100% residential from about 20th South, because my last road is 1820 South, and you can see there's still a while past that. So from about 20th South all the way up to about Third South, you have some businesses once you cross the freeway about six South, but that's purely residential, 100% residential with little kids and dogs, and we've had dogs hit there on that 25 mile an hour road. So to address some of Jonathan's statements, that is 
that is an issue. 40 feet, 5 inches. A normal road that size should be 54 feet of pavement, according to Dave Graves, our city engineer. Um, I think that's about all I have. Any, any questions? I have a question. You had said that um, in reference to some of these smaller neighborhoods or you know, specific areas, that they're really hard. Mm -hmm. what, does that, what does that mean to you? Um, the income level of Franklin, they are really low income. Um, really, really low income. And so from what I understood, the reason why they took our section out and bust them up there was to give some stability. But our, and then once these people, according to the Franklin uh, Community Center, once these people get a little bit more stable, they'll actually move to our neighborhood. But our neighborhood is not a very high income neighborhood. One of our houses with a three bedroom Rambler with a carport, no garage, just went for $210,000. You're not looking at people with a whole lot of money. You're looking at people with a, we're, we're a step up above what's above it. Does that make sense? We're not, we're not completely in dire straits like they are up in the Franklin neighborhood, but we're not, we're not the East Bench kind of folk either. Gotcha. So just to clarify, um, your sentiments are that you need less of that, or more of that, or mitigate that, or I I would say. Is something like that could be more absorbed over off of 1100 or somewhere over there is my sentiments. Because just right here, like I said, we're having problems. When I was talking to someone the other day, they were saying that someone with the LDS church did a study, and they found that poor wards don't function well. <laughs> and our ward does not function well. Um, you have to be able to sustain your people. And we don't sustain our people. And that's what I'm saying. It is, it's hard for people to sustain their people. And it would concern me to have, obviously, you're going to have some people that are going to want to buy in a medium density residential that aren't going to be poor. But a lot of them are. And I just don't think that we can absorb that right in that section. I think it would be better absorbed in a different section where you have people that have more income that can afford a bigger home that could care for those. It's kind of like um, all of the people in the boulders that are disabled, right? I mean, I've talked to some, because my kids go to the same schools, and, and they have a hard time in their ward absorbing all of that high density of disabled people because you just can't take care of them. And so it's the same thing here in my mind is, is it's just really hard to have poor people taking care of poor people and expect to help to pull them up, um, to give them a hand up when you're struggling yourself. Did that answer your question, Ms. Ellsworth? Um, yeah. Yeah. Just to clarify, are we, or you, were you on the committee? No. Oh, okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Bodkin. Yeah. Sorry, Are there any other neighborhood chairs present who would like to speak to this item? Sure. Committee members, then. Uh, one thing that hasn't been addressed much, oh, I'm David Arnold. Thank you. I was on the uh, committee that uh, worked on this. I've lived uh, by Footprinters Park for the last 25 years, so I've been in this area for a long time, raised my family here. Uh, one thing that really hasn't been addressed is the streets. So I'm on TMAC. It's one of the reasons I was on the committee is to look at the the flow. And this is this is a this is a solid street design for the main streets. Um, one of the things that we have to take into account is everywhere we we cross and go under or come off of that freeway. That's a barrier in our city. I-15 is a barrier. And so, like we've there was some comments about 500 West. Whether we want it or not, likely in a 10 to 20 year period, that, that road is going to be widened. Um, those, those houses will likely be purchased just because it's one of the only few places that it crosses I-15. It'll be done in a, a natural way, right? It'll be done in a, a way that makes sense. Um, 
So if you look at where the, the, the traffic is going to come into this neighborhood on and off of either under I-15 or off of it, this is a good solid street design for that. And that's one thing that hasn't come up. We've talked more about land use and not so much about how people are going to move around. And I think it's pretty solid in that regard. Um, the other, it was touched on lightly, the little, the, the dashed green are trail systems. So the dash, you'll notice that this is one area that's kind of unique. We, down here in the southern part on the west side here, we have open ground, right? And so these streets are dashed in where they're going to go. And it's our hope that uh, those dashed greens become um, low stress routes for bicyclists and for pedestrian. And it will make this neighborhood that emerges over the next 20 years unique in Provo. We've uh, invested, we've got this nice Lakeview Parkway to the south with trail systems on it. It goes all the way up and connects to the, the, uh, the Provo River Trail. And uh, with the new regional park that uh, is likely just to come in, you look at those green dashed uh, trails, it's, there's going to be a very unique, uh, um, it's going to make this part of Provo unique in the amount of trail system that it has. Um, Dry Creek, Dry Creek. I'm from Idaho. We say Crick up where I'm from. Um, it's, a, it's a natural resource. So our hope is as uh, property owners want to sell that and as developers want to or go about developing it, that we ask for that Dry Creek resource to be developed and become a community resource. Um, another thing that was clear to me, uh, there's a lot of opinions, right, down in the neighborhoods. Um, but we're not really, I don't think we, we don't aspire to be the rich part of town. You know, I moved here 25 years ago um, as a professor at BYU, similar to one or the other, and after that started a business. But we're, we live here because we, kind, we like a mixed neighborhood. And so I think most of us really like the mixed use. The, the we, we have, a, this is actually a challenge. I mean, there's the boulders and that area where people can get rental income or rental properties. There's not enough rental properties out in this part of, or, or low income housing. And so we like a mix in our neighborhoods of income and that will likely solve some of the problems of it getting too concentrated around, you know, in some of the school areas if we can distribute that high density throughout. And with that said, the, the MDR, the, the high density at the two freeway entrances makes sense. Uh, there are some challenges to it, but it's, it's the likely places if we're going to get transit to it ever. Those are the likely places for us to put the higher density and get transit to it eventually. So that's kind of my comments. I really like the flow of this from a mobility point of view. Mr. Arnold, if you, uh -huh. just, if you just stay there for a minute. Um, Planning Commission, one thing I'd probably like to point out to you is that a previous plan that the committee worked on actually had this collector road system coming in and then sweeping down to do something more like that. It's the current transportation master plan has the, the collector roads making these 90 degree turns. And so engineering asked us to make this map consistent with the current transportation plan. Now that we're in the process of writing a new transportation plan, an update to the transportation master plan, it, to me, it makes sense to put the road where it makes more sense and then have the transportation update match that. But to have a collector class system that forces two turns like that when we have open ground and the ability to make more of a sweeping S-curve, that makes more sense to me. If Planning Commission agrees, it would be good to have your input. If you don't agree, then, then let's leave it the way it is. But I'd just like to point that out. Yeah, that's why we left it there. But again, it's connecting the right places. We can move the roads a little bit, but it's got good connection points. Of course, not all the little streets are on there. But And we've been working hard in TMAC to try to, um, hopefully we don't end up with lots of cul-de-sacs. Yeah. Right? Because we want mobility in this part of town. We don't want all these dead-end streets, people not being able to walk around. We want an open network in this part of town because it's a green, I mean, it's green fields. We want to have connectivity so that we can walk around our neighborhoods and get around our neighborhoods. That is what we addressed in the text of the plan that will be the next step after this is adopted. Okay. Can I ask just one follow-up question? Sure. Um, I, I'm not trying to 
harp on this and I appreciate people's different responses to my concerns. You just happened to mention kind of spreading out um, the, the density. Um, it, does this map reflect that f accurately for you or, or, or would, would you personally rather, I mean, I, I really agree philosophically with you in terms of kind of mixing, um, you know, mixing different types of housing and different types of economic levels a little bit more evenly across to address, um, uh, is it Becky who spoke right before you? Uh, you know, some of her concerns about her particular neighborhood down here. Do you feel like this this current map goes as far as you would like it, or would you like to see it spread out even more, or perhaps, again, higher density occasionally than, than you have right now? It's, I, yeah, the, I, again, I the goal of this, I mean, we, we had a lot of competing interests, right, on the yeah. committee, or in the, the community. And so it does make sense to have the low density along that main corridor that we're building on the south, right? And I think some of the other reasons is it's pre-existing what's there today, but we all realize that 20 years from now, things change, right? I think it's really good for this neighborhood to have mix. It's not good to take all of our low income and put it all together. Um, one of the things that's important, though, if we're going to take low income and put it next to higher income is there has to be transitions. But they understand how to do that. They understand how to transition taller buildings down to shorter and, and, and create things. But that just creates better neighborhoods if there's mixed incomes in those neighborhoods. I mean, I'm higher income. I'm perfectly happy to be next to lower income. It's better for my children. It's better for, right? It's that, uh, having those different economic uh, strata come together is just good. It makes our schools stronger. I think it makes our communities stronger because we're not that much different, right? And we can help each other. So I think we're better. I, I would probably do a little more, yeah. but I would do it carefully with transitions. And, and of course, this is a plan. This People have to choose to sell their properties. Developers have to be motivated to develop it. You get that, right? But our hope is, and we also, it's uh, a little more detailed, I think, than maybe, I think that was your comment, maybe this is a too little detailed. We kind of have a vision for the area, and we want it to be in a little enough detail so people remember 10 years from now kind of what we had in mind or what we were trying to do. But I would be, I really like the idea personally of distributing the density throughout the, the community. But I couldn't agree with you more, and, and what I hear in your comments is, for me, a, 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 a bit of... Um, a, I don't know if I want to say kind of counter comment to what I've heard up to this point, but there is implicit in the, the, the comments that I, at least in my mind that I've heard that we want to keep our, you know, we want West Pro to be different and we want to maintain, you know, a certain kind of, um, environment and atmosphere. And, you know, I, I totally get that and I respect that. And that's what people who love their neighborhoods want. But I also hear kind of the, the underside of that is, we don't want to bear the burden that other places in Provo might have to bear. And, and, and what I hear in your comments is, you know, we're willing to bear that burden. And, and I guess my question would be, to what degree is that, you know, reflected in uh, both the map and, and then in the just kind of general attitude and, and conversations? Um, yeah, I, I think you, you, we want to strike that balance of, of, of making it unique, keeping it unique in the way that it's unique but also acknowledging that we ha we're going to bear increase, you know, across the city we'll have to bear increasing uh, um, responsibility for kind of economic diversity. We certainly have to bear environmental responsibility. I mean, that's not, that's not getting any, I mean, we're going to a place that we uh, have not been before environmentally and, and to act as if we weren't, to, to continue to think about land in our neighborhoods as if, uh, as if, we don't have to consider environmental responsibility, you know, all those things. I, I, again, I'm, it, I'm saying this because we happen to be talking about your, th this neighborhood, but I would say that every, you know, every neighborhood has to be willing to support uh, a wider economic mix, uh, a wider range of density, so that we're, uh, you know, so that we're just better stewards, we're better neighbors, you know, and, and all those, those reasons. And yeah, I mean, again, I think you're, you're saying what I feel like I'm feeling in a, in a way that, really resonates with me and yeah the question would be to what degree might this map be tweaked perhaps just a bit more again i don't i don't want to um, reject the great work that's gone into this and, and as i listen to people it's a it's an amazing feat to kind of comp make all these compromises that people have made uh, I, I just wonder if there's a little bit more that we might tweak to considering some of the things that you've mentioned and other things so um, i think the 
To respond to that, I, we do want our community to be special, right? We want it to have a unique character, because um, I think it does. Uh, but I think we can do that and disperse. It, but there is one other feel down there that uh, is, I think, pretty pervasive, but it might be the older generation and we're going to die, right? We like the open spaces. So that's the other main competing tension that this community feels is it likes the sight lines that we have. <laughs> it likes the open fields. But there's tension, right? Um, I mean, that's been expressed strongly on the committee is that we don't want to lose that uh, agricultural fill. I don't have an answer for that. Um, but there, but I'll repeat that that was another strong feeling from the committee at large was to be able to preserve that. But at least we have a regional park. It's 100 acres that's going to stay green, right? I mean, that's, that's major. So I don't have an answer for keeping all of that uh, open space, but that was strongly expressed by many. So. Thank you. Are there any other committee members or neighborhood chairs who would like to speak to this item? If none, any members of the community who would like to speak to this item? Dixon Holmes, Provo City Economic Development, 351 West Center. I'd like to address a couple of things. About, I was not on the committee. I attended several of the meetings as I was invited to attend from <coughs> my uh, role here at Provo City. I, I would concur with Mr. Halliday that while this area currently is agricultural in use, although there's a big commercial agricultural use right here with the McCord's uh, greenhouse, uh, and certainly as Mr. Pepperoni and Mr. Maxfield have indicated that as the property continues to be used as agricultural, they're welcome to do that, but at some point, because of its proximity to the airport, and it currently is in the airport environs, that that would potentially be allowed, and again, maybe that's another iteration for a future plan, but, but this area right here, um, that's probably a little far afield from the airport, but it, I mean, again, currently this is, I think this hash mark is the current airport environs, and again, again, the same with this property, nothing pushing right now, but not be surprised if for commercial development pressure in the future, but again, pro individual property owners and uh, concurrent with the municipal councils, they see fit to make changes, whether that should be agricultural in the future or some kind of airport related, but again, not a, not a hill to die on, but just as a suggestion. And then down here, um, this is actually a 36 acre parcel. Interestingly enough, a third of it is residential and th two thirds of it would be commercial. Um, I, I would probably not recommend it being shrunk any more than it is now and, and would probably encourage or at least be comfortable with this being MDR, um, again, as a transition. We only have two intersections in town, and while not necessarily pushing for uh, residential higher densities next to these intersections, probably a little more appropriate or could be appropriate. Again, with good design, uh, density can be addressed, as well as um, what kind of amenities are offered. And then I'd actually expand just a little bit more um, while this line right here has, has pretty much anecdotally said it will hold the line for any type of development. So anything south of this line here will kind of be what it is now, either wetland or agriculture. And I, I would agree with that, except on this corner, which is adjacent to the interchange. Uh, it doesn't have frontage, and this is the off-ramp, so there would be no direct access, but there is a, 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 about a 30 to 40 acre parcel right here it's about as low as this. Of course, it's a, a little slightly lower because it's that much closer to the lake. And I said we're not growing any more commercial land. Well, this is a piece we could actually grow for commercial land. If it was appropriate, if it could be serviced, it is on a light. There's a light right here. Um, so I would hold the line on development south except for this piece. And the exception would be because it is adjacent to an off-ramp. Um, and if the wetland, if the Corps of Engineers determines it's a wetland, then that's what it'll stay. If the Corps of Engineers acquiesces and says, no, this could be, it's an upland that can be developed, then I would recommend that that would be allowed to be done for or developed for a commercial, commercial use. And so those would be my only suggestions is keeping this uh, commercial an MDR. Although if it stayed LDR, again, not the end of the world, but just be nice to have a little higher density and, and more than one just spot in town. And then over here, the airport compatible type uses. So thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Hobbs. Kelly 
Ashley Watson with Bach Homes. Um, we are currently under contract for that southeastern parcel there. And I've spoken extensively with Becky and discussed this as well. And I understand the neighborhood obviously have, has concerns about density, specifically that neighborhood with the height and the way it's set up now. Um, I don't necessarily agree with Dick. Unfortunately, he's already gone. Um, we would like to see more residential there and less commercial. We would like to develop the whole parcel and we don't see it as a viable place for commercial. What we do envision there is a medium density residential for 12 acres. We're willing to do some commercial, but we just don't think the area would support the big box type of a store there. You know, the, the neighbors are not amenable to it. It's not something they like. The traffic it would draw and they don't appreciate it. We would like to do kind of a tapering of low density residential to townhomes to an apartment community and then the commercial on that southernmost portion. And we think that would be well suited. And speaking with Becky, I was actually the one that mentioned that article to her by Michael Hathorne that discussed that missing middle. And I think it applies to all communities and not just the LDS community in particular where when we have specific areas, the East Bench, for example, where we see this specific type of housing, the specific income, you don't see that regeneration. Their children cannot move into those neighborhoods because they cannot afford it. And that's the problem we're facing here, is that you know, you're finding clusters of set incomes and it's not helping the community any. We build a very different product than what is known as the boulders here. And that was one of her concerns as well, is that we would come in and build some apartments that would either be towering over everything or that would be you know, strictly lower income section eight housing. The product we build attracts families. We build very nice walk-ups that are between three and four stories and obviously we'd work with the community in finding something that suits it. We build splash pads, we do larger units, we do you know, three and four bedrooms, we do rentable townhomes. And so it provides that outlet for the type of community that you guys have been expressing is not represented on the west side which are people that are moving here perhaps for a new job or being relocated by a company that don't want to live in their idea of the east side of Provo, but they also don't want to jump in and buy a house, or maybe they're not ready, but they also don't want to live in a Boulders type community. So that's the type of community that we appeal to, and we really think that making 12 acres of it medium density residential with commercial that's tailored to suit this community creates a very walkable space there. And then it was also discussed with Becky, perhaps a continuation of trail system that would allow for access to the pedestrian bridge and then mass transit on the other side that is already existing is my understanding. Do you guys have any questions? Any questions for Ms. Watson? Can you point to us which area your company represents? Yes, that one right there. We're under contract for it now. We haven't purchased it yet, obviously. you know, okay. We need to figure out what can be done there. We'd prefer to come in and do all higher density residential, it's the most lucrative, but that's not effective for the community and we don't think it would be supported. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's good My name is George Carter. I live in the West End of Provo, 1800 West and 6 South. And I have a couple of questions. The first question, I talked to America Fusi before she was elected, and she told me that if she got elected mayor, that she would get us a grocery store in the West End of Provo. Uh, I, I ain't got that many years left. I just wonder how long before we'll get a, a store in the West End of Provo. We got a place down there, Smith owns it, can't somebody talk Smiths into building a store there or let Reams come back? Reams is the best store in county. <laughs> but, and then now my next question is, uh, they're going to put a new sewer plant in down below my farm there. How many years will that take? I think those are both questions, questions for staff. <laughs> so they're still debating on whether the tr treatment plant will go on the west side here or upgrade on the east side. Um, but either scenario, which everyone gets decided, they're thinking probably between 2022 and 2025. Don't take that long to get that sewer plant in before we can develop any of our ground, right? That's what they're thinking. That's what engineering is thinking as of today. Okay. And then my, my complaint is, is when they put that road in over there, 
they went through my farm, and I was the only one that had any buildings in the road, and they took my barns and hay sheds and stuff down, and put, practically stole it from us. I mean, for what they gave us for it, and what grounds going for it was, we had a piddling little amount, and that's okay, because they put, condemned us and put it on Emmett Domain, you know. And they sure didn't do us fair, none of us, on that ground. But what they did wrong, what happened was, is they ruined my farm and all my neighbors' farms. And by that, what I'm talking about is we have no irrigation. It's been sub-irrigated all my life, all my dad's life, and all my grandfather's life. And he, he owned all that ground at one time, my grandfather, from 1600 west to 2050 west. Well, further than that, what about 24th West? He owned all that ground from Center Street down. He'd be surprised if he could see it now. But you could plant corn or anything, any vegetables on my farm, I could plant anything. You never had the water, just a beautiful crop. But you can't do it now. You go down there, do you ever see any cornfields? Not one. Over on, on John Hinckley's ground, but he's got irrigation in the church farm. But from the church farm east to 11th west, there's no irrigation. And you can't grow anything there. The hay fields that's there, that's developed, they're fine. Because they have roots that'll go 18 feet deep, you know. So they keep living. But you take a hay field out and try to put a new one in, it won't grow. And neither will corn. Corn will come up about this high. By August, it's dead. There's no irrigation there, and it's bad. The only thing that ground's good for now is what we're trying to put in, and that's development. We've had a developer, but he's pulled out until they get the sewer done or whatever, you know. But I don't know. I can't blame it on the city or anything else. It's just where progress goes, and that's fine, and I'm with it whatever goes, but... Uh, I don't know how long it is. They're developing right now on 1600 West, you know, east of 1600 West. They're putting a huge bunch in there, about 80 houses, I think. They're, de they're, they're starting out. They've already got it all dug up, and it's neat to see it go, because that ground's been dead for quite a long time, no water. If you don't have water, you don't have anything. I mean, the weeds will grow. You don't have to plant them. They, they do it's just fine on dry ground. They'll grow in the middle of the road. So, anyhow. Get us a grocery store, will you? <laughs> if you vote for me for mayor, I'll promise you a grocery store. Too. <laughs> <laughs> if you voted me, voted for if you vote for me when I run for mayor, I'll promise you a grocery store as well. <laughs> <laughs> I love you guys. I know them and them and them. Thank you, Mr. Carter. <laughs> Good friends of mine, all you guys. Thanks. Thank you, Thank you George. I know it's getting late, but I'll be quick. Um, I'm Marsha Judkins, and I am the state representative for most of this area. And I was just sworn in in June, July, so I'm really new. But I have been concerned for a long time about the agricultural land and when, and well, I wanna say, I really appreciate all the time and effort that's gone into this, and I appreciate your thoughtful questions and, and considerations. Um, I too like living on the west side and the diversity that's down there and think we do need to spread you know, all the, all the good people all over. So, but um, I'm very worried about, about the state of agricultural lands, um, not just here in Provo, but the whole from Santa Quin up to Tremont or wherever it goes that we have. Um, we used to be um, exporters of agriculture and now we could not feed our state and we need to be very careful about how we treat the agricultural lands as you can see it's not just um, it's not just plowing them down and developing them but the way that we put our roads and things really affect and there's not very many good um, good agricultural lands left in Provo but I'm uh, we have a commission on agriculture and I, we're going to try to find the land that is the best for growing. And, and we're not saying nobody can sell their lands, but I also want to fund, um, fund the McAllister Fund so that, so that we can pay for the lands from the farmers um, because they have the right to sell to whoever they want. But if we can, 
I don't know, just save. I just want you to be careful, and I know you are. You, you look like very careful people, and that you really are thoughtful. Um, but I think when, when Dixon was saying about uh, in the future, or we're thinking about developing all these, I, I, we just, I just had to stand up. I wasn't going to, and just say, let's be careful about what we do. Could you, um, maybe with a pointer, point out, I'm just not familiar on the south side of this road, what is currently kind of, what land uh, is currently agriculture versus marshlands, and I'm just not. On the south side, there's, I don't, there's nothing there now of agriculture, right? You, you could talk to these guys, they'd be farms. much there's farms looking brighter at. about that. Yeah, yeah there's, there's farms but there's, there. I don't, is anybody farming south of there now? Yes. yes. Oh, there still are farms yes, south of there? Are. So I was talking about those areas up there. So. Because that was what Dixon was saying, right? We have an agricultural commission committee here in the city. Yes. And they've asked us to do these same types of things. And what makes a lot of sense to me is for that committee to work with Mr. Hinckley. That's the largest piece of land and single ownership and try to use Lee Ray, Lee Ray McAllister funds to work out something with him to see if his property can eventually be purchased for ag preservation. It's an active farm now. It would be right next to a 100-acre city park, so that would be a significant area of preservation. But I've suggested to the ag committee to work at some real achievable solutions like that, that it's kind of unfair to come to the planning department and say, we have the desire to preserve agriculture, planning, Commission, you guys make it happen. Yeah. It's really hard for us to well, wrap and our it's, arms around. It's not fair to people who have seen their neighbors sell their property for millions of dollars and then to say, oh, but you can't because we want to preserve your agricultural land. You know, right. and so of course there has to be a solution, but I don't know. I'm hoping the McAllister Fund wasn't funded at all last year, and that's, and so I'm, I'm hoping that that changes this year. I'm going to push for that, but I think we do. We do. So, anyway. That's, that's good to know. I mean, right now, if I'm reading the numbers right, this constitutes about 20% of the, of the land included in this map. And to, to cut into it, um, you know, whittles that down. And, again, I, I don't know if people who are working on it have a certain percentage in mind that they're aiming for or just kind of preserve as much agricultural land as possible through the McAllister funds or, or well, what the goal is, but. I, I really am a newbie on all this, but I was talking to um, Richard, um, uh, how come I can't remember his last name, Wilkerson, and he's the one who took me on this whole tour, and some agricultural land is better than others, and so what we really need to do is find out which land um, is the best to preserve, and then the McAllister fund can go towards that and everything else could just be developed to however you choose, see fit to do. Does that make sense? And so we're not anywhere really close to knowing, I guess, exactly, or and how much land do we even need to, to be self-sustaining in the state to feed ourselves, you know? I don't know. There's a lot of reasons that we would want to preserve agricultural land. Um, is, is there a way on this map to indicate the possibility of preserving some of the agricultural land here where it's currently airport? industrial commercial or did you choose not to represent that possibility or is this, is this a very new possibility and so that's why it's not no it's being used as ag land now and it's zoned ag land now and so it's ag land mm -hmm. this is saying that 10 or 20 years in the future if you want to do something different here's a possibility but as long as the property owner wants to leave it in ag and if somebody else can buy the rights to it so it stays in ag then I think that's a good solution to pursue. Um, the problem is, is though, even if all of this was saved as ag and the farmers are telling us would do you no good because you can't water it, even if all this is saved as ag, it doesn't do a lot for adding to our food base, food supply. Yeah, I would just add that I wrote um, the county's policies as a consultant in another life um, for agriculture and environmental everything and um, there's two reasons for agriculture or I guess there's two reasons there's one reason for agriculture and that's food we're not producing food on the west side we're producing alfalfa um, and the cows that we do produce in the state of Utah that do feed us they're not getting their alfalfa from Provo 
Um, and the other reason it would be to maintain open space for aesthetic, which is a great reason too. Um, but yeah, I mean, this like open space is not the same as low density housing. It's very unique. And I'm not sure if I'm understanding you correctly, but I think we also have to look to the future of where we might not be farming it now, but we need to be able to farm it in the future for a variety of reasons. You know, if, if something happened to California or if whatever, we don't know what's going to happen in the future. And if we have land that's set aside that we can farm, um, <clears throat> that could make all the difference. I mean, there's more than just that, but um, I think we need to look to the future and be able to be self-sustaining as a state to feed ourselves. I think that's important. Not that we have to be farming it right now, but we need to be able to do that. So even if it's alfalfa now, if we could farm it in the future, then. Yeah, and then, the, and then like we mentioned earlier, water is a huge water component huge. of that. Yeah, but I do think everybody needs to get paid for their property if they want to sell, so I'm not trying to say, say no, you know, or something like that. I'm, I'm hoping to think of solutions with the legislature, so anyway. That's all. Any questions? Thank you. I really don't know anything, so sorry. I just had to jump up. My name is Matt Carter. <laughs> There's several questions that come up that we could take a look at this whole area, three or four hundred acres in here, is nothing compared to what people need to feed people. There's more agriculture down one road in Idaho than there is in a big share of Utah. You go back in the Midwest, there's big farms. This doesn't do much. There, it was mentioned that we don't have any great amount of water down in this area, and that's true. And I mentioned that in the letter that I sent to Bill earlier. Slide you gave, you were given. Yes, we have a copy of that. Thank you. Uh, this road compressed the soil, and now the water does not come from Utah Lake up under this land that George Carter mentioned. Previously, we could just kick the soil down there and you'd hit moisture. you plant your seeds and they would get the roots down to the moisture, but not now. The wells are drying up. And I just talked to Tom Halliday and his over in this area are drying up and all of these wells here are dried up when Provo City pumps. And uh, I think there's a new pump project in Geneva that has some huge wells. When they pump, our wells go dry. Over here on the, this area, they still have some river water, but over in this area, I don't know how much Provo City is still providing any irrigation in a lot of this area. Maybe somebody here knows, but I don't. I think they've closed it, most of it down. Do you know, Bill? It's all shut off. So that's, that's where we stand on farms. We can't make any living on those farms. We used to have dairies in there. There was lots of dairies in Provo. But that's pretty much gone completely. I don't even know if there's any on Geneva Road left. Yeah, there's one. This area right here that's in green, if you're going to say that's supposed to stay agriculture, Suppose sometime in the future they'd like to develop. Now they have to redo the whole, the whole plan before they could develop. If you, if you say that they, they can just do what they're doing as long as they want, and then they, then they can move over to one of these other things, that's doable. But when you say that they can't, it's supposed to remain agriculture, you've got to change the whole plan all over again because there was a couple of farms over here that can't develop like their neighbors did over here. 
there's a canal that goes down this 2050 west and it goes right between these farms here and the farms here. And because they dug the canal deep, it sucks the water and it doesn't go sideways. There's lots of things to, to say about that. Uh, when it comes to getting the roads put in, one's, one's red and one's white, it looks like. Getting the roads, they go down there and they, they got to have land from the farms. If they want drains, they've got to have land from the farmers. And all these people develop, are on developed ground and they have their homes and now they want to say that we have to keep this in agriculture as much as possible or, or go with low density. They get high density, just right up here, eighth north, there's a, some a big apartment buildings and all through sit the Provo City, big apartment buildings. And it was mentioned just a few minutes ago, the things that are getting okayed appears to be apartment buildings. But if, if we would like a little higher density down here, they, they say no. However, I've been to some of these meetings before, and some of the members of this commission said we need more homes. They'd like to see their kids be able to stay in Provo. And they kind of indicated that they may okay some higher de density. I kind of got my hopes up at that time. You come down this 2050 West, a few people can get a little bit higher density. And over here you can get a little bit higher. But what about the other landowners? They can't get the higher density. And so a few people down here can get a little higher density, but the rest of them can't. And so your favorite, again, you're playing favorites to some landowners and telling other landowners no. So, it was mentioned that if they wanted to keep this in agriculture, they could start paying development prices for the land. And then a few people could have a garden or whatever they want to do, have a community garden. I don't know what they would do. And everybody can't have land down here, so again, you're playing favorites, but they, they'd have to pay high prices to, to make it fair to everybody, the ones that get to sell for homes and the ones that have to keep it in agriculture. And there's no water anyway. They talk about the big streets, uh, the small streets, and I was kind of under the impression when we okayed this road or sold out to the city, this would help to take care of getting the people into this area. Now they're still going back to 5th West and 1600 West and all these, and all these small roads it wasn't mentioned that they can turn up this way. So anyway, I'm in favor that the landowners can sell for a little higher density. And if you can put that along these collector roads, these collector roads extend some of these areas up these collector roads and this collector road, this collector road, if they put that one in, that's, that'll be a new road and they won't let anybody have any driveway onto it. 
they're going to have to turn off of that, and so there's no, there's no frontage there. That doesn't help the landowner at all to, with, with any frontage. Still, it goes back to it. It uh, makes an advantage to Provo to get a collector, but it doesn't help the landowner maybe as much as it should. Well, that's my my views. Thank you, Mr. Carter. Hi, um, my name is Julie Carter Bradshaw, and we just own property next to George Carter and Max, and I just want to agree with um, what's been said about the higher density. We just, I think we would just really appreciate if you guys would put that along the collector roads to just um, help with congestion in the city. I just think that would be one of the better plans if, if you are looking at doing higher density. I think that along the collector roads and 2050 would be the best place to put it. And that's all I want to say. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other members of the public who would like to speak to this item? You've had. Somebody asked a question. Sir, you've had, you've had your share of time. That's all to make it quick. Somebody asked a question about this area right here. This does not go immediately into swampland. There are some beautiful springs right in here. There are some ground that we had pastures on. The lake can come up on that ground, some, some, but it doesn't usually, it does not usually come all the way up. That could make a wonderful park area down in there with the springs and the pasture ground that's high enough. I used to own some of this land in here, and we pastured down quite a ways, and we, we and Tom Halliday owned right next to me, right over here, and he pastured down quite a ways. It would make a lovely park. I don't know what Provo City's planning on doing with that. However, they, when they took this roadway, they wanted our land below the below down here and it was kind of like a sell out or eminent domain that's what we were under was eminent domain if we didn't sell out here and and sell the road the roadway but that's a good place to put a park and so keep that in mind bill that's up to you Thank you. <clears throat> My name is Richard Lewis. I am a real estate and I work with developers and investors at, for 48 years. And mostly, except for the last 20 years in California, and I've been here for 20 years. And let me tell you, I represent landowners up here on Lakeshore, north of Center and some developers that have come in there. We've tried everything to get that property going. And I've just got one question. This is all great when. I know some that have put a lot of money in and every time we go to into the planning commission or we get something done, it's turned down. So my question is when. Mr. Pepperoni. Probably not till 2022 to 2025. That's one of my biggest fear about this map and moving forward with the West Side plan is the more we planning we do, the more it sends the message to the development community they're ready to start approving development. But until we solve the sewer problem, we're not ready to approve development. We had the sewer problem resolved. So that wasn't a question. It's just zoning overlay. Thank you. Thank you, sir. 
Are there any other members of the community who would like to speak to this item? If not, I will turn it back over to the commissioners. If, uh, if I could make a suggestion, um, certainly want to hear your comments, but perhaps based on the amount of input we've received and the suggestions that have been made, would it be helpful to you if we made some amendments to the map and then made the map the subject of your study session and your next planning commission meeting so that we could talk about some of the questions and issues that have been raised in a form where we could actually discuss possible answers to those things? Would that, would that be a good way to proceed? I think that would be very helpful. You think the, the <clears throat> committee could meet to, would meet together and talk the map over again? Whatever you recommend, whatever committee members recommend. I'd suggest that we meet together and then, and then we put it together. I can try to set up a meeting next week, so that'd be a week before the planning commission meeting. Okay. So the West Side Citizen Advisory Committee would meet and discuss the things that were heard tonight, suggest any changes, and then we would meet with you. And then the map would be the subject of your study session a week later. Got it. Good. You better have a motion Sounds to that effect reasonable. if that's agreeable to you. Yes. Agreeable. Very agreeable. <laughs> so. Looking for a motion from the commissioners on item five. I motion that we continue this item until we've gotten a newer draft from the uh, West Side Committee and uh, review it in our uh, study meeting. So Ms. Ellsworth is recommending that uh, we recommend a continuation of item five to municipal council until the West Side Citizen Advisory Committee and the Planning Commission Working Group meet again to review this item. We anticipated that would be on the September 26 work session. So we're anticipating at this point. Anticipating September 26 for a working session with the Planning Commission. Do we have a second for that motion? Second. Seconded by Mr. Knudsen. All those in favor of forwarding a request for continuance on item five to municipal council? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay, we'll forward a recommendation for continuance on item five. Commissioners, do we have a motion to adjourn? I motion that we adjourn. I Second. move that we adjourn. Second. Meeting adjourned. <laughs>